we are bullshit. He watches his mother shoot his father three times in the back. I'm Mr. Blackman. There's the puppies. I look like Quasimodo to you. What about Johnny Lauer? What about China? Big fish of a deathbed. All right, Impact. Last week's Impact had a atrocious first hour, a horrible first hour, and a great, great second hour. This week, a really good first hour, and boy, what a shitty second hour they had. I'm going to, for once in my life, take the optimistic viewpoint. I'm going to take the last half of last week's show and the first half of this this week's show and say they produced two straight hours of awesome TV. I guess it would have been two straight, yes. Sadly, there was seven days in between. <laughs> and then there was also... And there was shit on either end of it, so yes. there you go. We had a good video package opening up this show. It actually was really good. Angle and Tomco. We had, uh, for those of you that didn't listen to the show today, Figure Four Daily, Kevin Nash no-showed. I know that some huh. of you will be surprised to hear such a thing, but he did, in fact, not show up for the the program. He was supposed to call at noon. It is currently 11.27 p.m., and he has not called yet, so I'm thinking that it is, in fact, a, a no-show. But we had a, a show today. We had four guests on, Mike Coughlin talking UFC, and we had Oliver Kopp and Mike Sawyer talking UFC, and they were there live, actually. So they had a lot to uh, talk about, including some scoops about Ultimate Finer, some other stuff. And then we had Lance Storm on the show. And Lance Storm, of course, a, a vociferous critic of, of TNA many times. And he also noted that this video package was great. And then he noticed it would have been greater if it were building up over three or four weeks to a pay-per-view. Indeed. Well, it did not. <laughs> I, I, baby steps. <laughs> Just uh, entertain me in the short term, then we'll worry about building to a long term. Well, they deal. could not even do that. By the time the show was over, they had failed. No, by short term, I mean a segment. <laughs> we had Angle, AJ, and Karen, who, of course, were fighting. Lorash was in a neck brace. The deal was that AJ finally decided he wasn't a geek anymore and was standing up to Angle. Kurt tried to blow him off, and AJ said he wasn't a goof. He was a three-time former champion. Angle laughed at him. Karen got in there. I think she got shoved or something. Angle snapped and told AJ not to touch his wife and said if AJ helped Tom Chris tonight, he not only was going to kick his ass, but AJ's ass as well. And he kicked him out of the office, and AJ said, fine, I'm gone. And I watched this, and it was like, did I miss four shows? Why is AJ Styles all of a sudden a tough guy standing up to Kurt Angle? What the fuck did I miss here? <laughs> I, I, I See, that's – I don't know a why. I don't have a why. All, all, all I know is they had the really awesome Tom Angle video package. They had AJ not being a geek and Kurt not being a goof and both guys being – Badass, especially Kurt being a complete badass. And I thought, holy cow, <laughs> this makes no sense, but it's better. Yeah, this was better than the usual bullshit. Team 3D cut a promo about the pay-per-view, talking about how they're going to kill the X Division. And and he was cutting his promo and he had all this crazy heat. And then all of a sudden they cut to a shot of Black Machismo, Chris Saban, and Alex Shelley dressed up as old school Dudleys being wacky. And you could just hear the heat die in the building. That's bad. So as they were ranting, Team 3D ran in and beat him up, rather violently, in fact. And Mike Tenney, of course, had to alert us that the good guys were mocking the bad guys and were not really the Dudleys. <laughs> yes, had to alert us to this fact. <laughs> yeah. So then Team 3D dragged him down to ringside and continued beating them, and Machismo gigged, and Saban and Shelley got put through tables, and Bubba finally screamed that they were uh, they were little boys in a man's world, talked about how they were... They were heroes in ECW, legends in WWE, and now gods in TNA. And if God was a heel, he'd be in Team 3D, and he warned the X Division not to show up at the pay-per-view. And this was a fabulous, fabulous promo by Bubba Ray Dudley. Yes. And it actually ended up being great stuff. And the show was on a roll. The, the beatdown went on forever, but it, it established the point that, hey, the heels have just gotten the heat on the baby faces in this angle. They've laid them down and laid them out and had their way with them, and then and, and, and the bubble cut his fiery promo... It was awesome. They didn't rush anything. They did not go to the back. They just let the angle be what it was. They came. They get plenty of time. Then they went to commercial, and then they came back, and the most amazing thing happened. 
They recapped it. Yes. They had a recap package of what just happened. Yes. In case someone had happened to, you know, step away from the television for a second. I was astounded. <laughs> this show was like 50 minutes old, and I was so happy. This was a thumbs up. Yes. And we had Crystal interviewing Scott Steiner and Petey Williams. Steiner now apparently is having his promos written as if he's a rock. He actually used the line, he screwed up Crystal's name, and then said, it doesn't matter what your name is. Zing! So low rent. <laughs> so she told him that if Team 3D won at the pay-per-view, there would be no more X Division, and he couldn't get a title shot at the X Division title. And he said, Petey, did you know anything about this? And Petey goes, that's a rumor, but it's your problem, not mine. And Scott said, well, listen, if it's my problem, it's your problem. Moral of the story is, Scott doesn't watch the show. Correct. Scott has no idea what is going on in this program, and why would he? But th- th- this was wacky, but it was short enough I didn't care, and then it just went right into the next match. I actually like the the, uh, the angle with Scott Steiner being the one guy that doesn't actually watch the show well, and he, never has any idea what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it works. He, he thinks the, he th- first he thought the exhibition was all about being four feet tall and 100 pounds. He just shows up to beat ass. <laughs> he, he doesn't show- care about all the other bullshit. He goes to do his job or he's assigned to do, and that's all. So we had Rock and Rave infection against Steiner and Petey. They're a team now. Rave apparently is the new young Billy Gunn. So I should tell you what he and was he, wearing he, and did with his hair. A wacky single ponytail thing. So Petey stole a bunch of spots from Scott's arsenal and this and that. And finally Scott ran in and ran wild, suplexing everybody out of their boots and screaming, that's how you do it, to Petey. Tagged him back in. And as Petey set up for the Canadian Destroyer, Scott grabbed both briefcases and started heading to the back. Petey yelled at him, and so Scott clonked him with one of them and then bailed. And Rave got the pin, and Christy bounced her boobs up and down, and there you go. Rock Rave Infection, this is week two of the Guitar Hero phase. I now love these men. They are now both so over-the-top wacky heels. They've both been this, the most boring dudes I've ever seen forever. Forever. It's been years I've been watching these guys. I've never cared about either one. Now they're awesome. They're fake rock stars, and it's great. Then we had the best video package I've ever seen. The bullet was training young BG. The bullet can move. <laughs> oh, yeah. The bullet is, in fact, in better shape than his son. The best part was doubt about that. BG struggling on the incline press, and so Bullet grabbed the bar and curled it back up to the rack. And then at the end of all this running, BG yacked, and god damn, this was great. This is wacky fun. Yes. Hernandez and Billy Gunn. Salinas has enormous breasts. And by the way, for those of you wondering why she is now Salinas and not Shelly Martinez, they wanted a name that was Hispanic. Her name is Martinez. <laughs> yeah. That's a Hispanic name. This is true, though. Is that not the best story you've ever heard? How retarded are these people? <laughs> That's the best story I've ever heard. They couldn't heard. just call her Martinez. No. It's what tards? So then we had uh, we had some stuff. The voodoo chick, or Selene's tried to interfere, and the voodoo chick broke it up, and she tried to throw powder and accidentally hit Kip, and then Hernandez pinned him. And Anyway, the point is this annoyed me because they had interference twice, the first of which meant nothing. Why do you do that? Well, because they're TNA. Just don't do that, everybody. If you have an interference, if you need to have interference, you don't need it twice because then the second interference is just it's it anyway. It's just lame. we've given this piece about nine thousand so times. Angry. It's like they distracted the ref and it led to nothing, and then they distracted the ref again and it led to the finish. And I was like, why did you waste my time with the first distraction? Why? Just to annoy me. Apparently, I, I don't have an answer for you. So, anyway. so Kip yelled at the voodoo queen. He made, made fun of her that all she does is shake, and she hasn't done anything for them since they hired her, and then he fired her. No, actually, it was worse. He said, you wear too much makeup. <laughs> too much makeup, yes. You shake around too much. You dress like you're straight out of the 80s, and you talk too much. Killed the joke. Yes. That line utterly killed the joke. But, of course, it's TNA, so they don't understand. That's this. what they do. They understand comedy. Yeah, so then he fired her. Oh, and it gets better. After he goes, you wear too much makeup, you shake around like you're having a seizure, you're dressed straight out of the 80s, and you talk too much. Don West had to make sure to say, why she never talks. <laughs> yes, because this is TNA. It's comedy for fuckwits. For people who don't get the joke and have to have it explained to them. So yes, Kip fired her. Yes. I went into this thinking, Kip James and Hernandez, this could be ugly. First thing I noticed was that, holy crap, Kip James is a gigantic man. Dude, that's, we say that every time he's in the ring with anybody large. Yes. and it, it, Or anybody small. It rings true again. Then they had a match, and you know what? It was okay. It I, was, was fine. It was fine. And then yeah. uh, Shelly Martinez's breasts are, in fact, the new stars of the LAX Act. The, <laughs> Hernandez and Homicide are completely secondary. It's all about her tits. 
And they have their little match. What a pig. I'm, I'm merely stating how it's presented. <laughs> they, 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 they do the entrance, and she's up in the apron gyrating, and the camera zooms in on her chest as they play the theme song. That's all it's about. Yeah. I'm just stating how it's presented. So then they did the match, and it was fine, and then Voodoo Chick got fired and was so heartbroken that, well, I guess we'll talk about that later. AJ met with Tom Coe and said, listen, we're the champions of the world, but I don't want you taking this match because Kurt's my boss, and Tom Coe told him to shut up and say he should have punched him last week, and AJ was acting like a schoolboy, he said, having fallen for Karen. AJ said, she's into me. She told me. I have her wrapped around my little finger. Tom Coe said, leave me alone. I'm doing this match, and that's final. We had the all-access Brock Lesnar plug, which was awesome. And uh, the best part about this is you got Brock Lesnar there swinging tires or whatever the fuck he's doing, and Angle's talking about what a badass he is, and it's just great. And then all of a sudden they cut to Messias and a jobber, Corey Javis, I believe is his name. The first thing they did was they they, they, they had this, you know, the, the, this Brock Lesnar doing the real fight. Then they cut to the Barred Wire Massacre package, which is all about torture and... Freak show and blood, and they called it, and I quote, a masochist's dream. Oh, yeah. Not a sadist's, a masochist's. So apparently they're just going to take turns running into the barbed wire over and over again. <laughs> then Macias came out, and he's got the robe on and the purple robe, and his, he's got fre- freaky Jim Mitchell there with the beard and the, and the purple suit, and he's and Macias has this rubber Halloween mask on, and that's when you go, you go from Brock Lesnar doing a real fight to Judas Macias trick-or-treating. Yes. Fail. Then after Messiahs won, Jim Mitchell cut a promo about Chris and how he was Chris's father. And his delivery is so awesome. But this storyline is so ridiculous in 2008 that it's such a turnoff. Well, it's so pointless. It's again, so stupid. Again, after right, immediately after the UFC package where the feud is based around who will win, this feud is based around, around who is whose father or brother. Oh, and by the way, they repeatedly refer to Mitchell or refer to Abyss and Messias as stepbrothers. Now, Mitchell has said he's Messias' father, and now he's no revealed. No one cares but you. That he's Chris's father. That would not make them stepbrothers. That would make them half brothers. God damn it! Thank you, Vince. You're welcome. This was driving you crazy all night, and I was like, no one cares, literally in this world, except you. But I do care. Thus, I had to say it. Jesus, Shark Boy cut a promo. Said he had an open challenge for anybody, and no one came out. Don't ask me why. So then he beat up Slick Johnson and gave him a stunner, and then a bunch of geeks came out and he gave them stunners, and it got over. The people were actually cheering and going crazy, and I thought, what is happening? <laughs> I don't know. Shark Boy is about to actually become the most popular guy in this company, being Steve Austin. Yes, for, for me personally, the joke is old. I'm, I'm no longer laughing at it, but the people still love it, so whatever. Bunch of shit happened in Cornette's office. I don't know what. I know Nash was there. I know AJ was there. I know Cornette said, slow down, cowboy. Of, there's a lot of shouting. Kevin Nash referred to uh, Morgan as Giant Val Kilmer, which is one of the worst insults I've ever heard. I don't know what that meant. Pitching about contracts, and AJ wanted the match broken up, and it was just lame. Then we had AJ in the ring with Cornette. AJ still had a stupid-ass crown on, uh, and Cornette made the match. Uh, AJ special referee Tom Coangle, I cried. I cried. Guaranteeing. I have been so ruined. excited for this match, and they put this in there, and I suddenly knew, gonna be shit. It's gonna, they, 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 yes. They, they ruined, they sabotaged their own show right here. They literally said, the main event will suck, everyone. Yeah. It'll be stupid. They promised Awesome Kong's first interview, but our new manager, a chicken and veil with the fakest accent you've ever heard, read a statement, and it was dumb. They have turned Kong into a cartoon character, and they're fast on track to ruining her. This, it certainly didn't her no favors, as as she, uh, the, the the manager chick said that Kong is a woman of peace, and then Kong smiled, Then the manager chick said, unless you agitate her, and then Kong made a mean face. Lame. Failure. ODB, Voodoo Chick, and Angelina Love. Speaking of failure, I thought this match was a complete mess. Angelina took the ref by rubbing her breasts in his face. ODB had a pin on Voodoo, but there was no ref. So as ODB went to figure out what was up, Love slid under her legs and covered Voodoo. Or no, she covered Voodoo, and the ref slid under OB, ODB's legs and counted the pin. And and I was thinking, why did they just 
have ODB not win this match. Yes. Okay. What, what, what is what does Angelina Love have to do with this ODB <laughs> uh, Awesome Kong storyline? Let, 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 let's start with that. ODB has a title match against Awesome Kong in two weeks. You would think here she's in a three-way. Okay. It's going to be very simple. The other two are going to gang up on her. She's going to overcome the odds, fight them both off, and get the win, and look strong going into the pay-per-view. Simple? Effective? Sure. What they did instead was they had ODB and Roxy. They both wanted to be the one to beat up Angelina. So one of them would beat up Angelina, and then ODB would shove her out of the way and beat over Angelina for a while. So basically, Angelina was the baby face here. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. Second of all, the match was just no good in general. They were falling all over the place, and it was it was just just bad and ugly. And then the finish came, and I just I was gobsmacked, flabbergasted, <laughs> astounded. I, I I could not believe what had happened. It was so it was so pointless, and I didn't understand what what the point of any of it was. Best of all, immediately afterwards, OD ODB was outraged, and so she beat up Angelina Moore so to to quote get her heat back unquote. And I just know. Somewhere backstage, there was a man who was saying, "Everyone thinks everyone thinks ODB is going to win this. We need to swerve them. We need to swerve them, so we'll have ODB not win and then beat her up at the end. Bad idea. Bad bad idea. And also we should note, yes, Roxy Laveau, 20 minutes after being fired, was still out here wearing too much makeup, shaking around and dressing like Stevie Nicks. Still wasn't talking." Still not talking. I want to know. I, my my question was much more simple than that long-winded tirade that you just went on, which was simply, if Angelina was going to win, why did you beat her up afterwards? Same thing. <laughs> to make sure nobody gets over. That's the goal. To suppress all stardom. We had a quick Tomco angle brawl backstage, which was a completely unnecessary segment, and they immediately cut away. They replayed the Charmel Robert Root angle again, which just brought joy to my heart because this is like the first angle that they're really making a big deal of in 2007. And by the time this damn year's over, it may be the only thing I remember for that very reason. Today was in the ring and interviewed Booker on the big screen, and he said Charmel was doing well, would be back soon, thanked everybody for their support. Then Robert Root and Peyton came out and, and demanded they go to break, and today he said, Since when are you and the man in charge? And then Mike today said, Let's go to break! <laughs> So apparently the answer is, since right now. We had a Rude, James Storm, and Peyton against Sanjay Dutt, Eric Young, and Tracy. Yes, Peyton and Tracy in the ring together, unbilled, no advertising, just on impact. Sure. These people have no patience. So we got the wacky... Um, the wacky uh, girls going after each other, the cat fight. Tracy chased her to the back. Storm super kicked Eric Rude. Game the Fisherman suplex for the pin. Rude is awesome. He's another guy that should be pushed towards the title. If you'll recall, he was doing something with Angle and then just... He's not no more. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Things changed. Yeah. All right, so. here's what happened in this match. They had the heat on Eric Young. There oh, be- we forgot. At the end, Booker ran down. So the... Thing on the big screen apparently been a swerve. It had been a trap. He was not actually via satellite. He was backstage. He flew all the way there so he could chase Robert Root yes. to the back. He chased down to the ring. Root saw him and ran away, and, and Booker chased him to the back, and that was it. That was that. Okay, here's the story of this match. They were, had the heat on Eric Young. They were beating him up. My telephone rang. I went to answer it. I had a brief conversation. I hung up. I looked up. Robert Root was pinning a man. I missed the hot tag. I missed the comeback, and I missed the finish. I went back to my phone. I was on the phone for 25 seconds. <laughs> that is not enough time to do the hot tag, the comeback, and the finish. But in TNA, they found a way. Thumbs down, everybody. Thumbs down. Kaz did a promo. Speaking of thumbs down, I don't know what. It was a failure. That's all you need to know. He was apparently dressed up like Black Rain. He was called... White Thunder. sunshine. White sunshine, because, you know, rain, sunshine, black, even though white. rain is not the liquid in the black rain name. This was so stupid. And then it peaked when he said next week there will be a match involving poles. Four of them. God. Okay. Here's no, quite down. Cornette was in the ring for the contract signing. I know you're just going to rant about something. Is it is it a value and will take less than 15 minutes? It explains how stupid Kaz is and how stupid the show is. Well, go ahead. Kaz is angry at Dustin Rhodes, Black Green. So he challenges him to a match where there are four poles. Three of them have mousetraps in them. So 
Kaz is so angry, he is going to challenge us into a match where there is a three out of four chance that he himself will get struck by mousetraps. Yes. Stupid. Cornette was in the ring for the contract signing. Morgan was there with Cornette, and Nash was there with Joe. And Cornette was acting stressed out, and he couldn't find a pen. Morgan said he had one. He threw it at Joe's face. Joe went nuts. Morgan pie-faced him, so Joe gave him a backdrop driver through the table. Nash cackled. Joe tore up the contract, threw it on Morgan's body. To the back! I asked the question again. <laughs> why is Joe a baby face, and why would anyone give a shit about a baby face bitching about how much money he's making? I don't get it. You see, when you asked earlier about who cares about the, the Mitchell Abyss Messiah storyline, this is my who cares. This is my ultimate who cares. Who cares about Joe's contract or the money or Nash's ad- advisor role or Morgan's jealousy or Cornette's incompetence because he didn't bring a fucking pen to the contract signing? Shouldn't this all be about the title? You would think. You Why would is think. this about what Joe's making? Is he going to send me a paycheck? Moreover, if Joe had the dream contract and he gave him all his demands, why did he tear it up? Now he's back to being unemployed. No, here's what you missed. He's not unemployed. This was a, a renegotiation. So when Cornette said, soon he'll sign this contract and we'll be able to control him, he was currently under contract. Right. So why can't they control him now? I don't know. I hate this shit. So, so Joe tore up his own big raise. Yeah. Great. Yeah, because because a pen had been thrown at him. And now we're supposed to care. Okay. We're supposed to get behind him. A pen was thrown at him, so he th- he tore up a great offer. And now we're supposed to get behind him when he bitches about his pay the next time? If I go into work on Monday, and they offer me a contract paying me 15% more than the highest paid guy, and then throw a pen at me, I'll, I'll pick the pen up off the floor and sign it. Immediately. Not Joe. Joe's a man of... He's uh, a hero. I don't know what he is. Except... Part of a bad program. Then we had Angle and Tomko with AJ as ref, presumably non-title. I don't know if they ever actually said, but it was assumed, I guess. Assume nothing, my my teacher once told me in junior high. TNA just assumes everything, or assumes we know everything. So, of course, AJ immediately starts doing slow counts. Match, dead. (laughs) From the get-go. Out of the gate. They ruined this. I wanted to see this match so bad, and they ruined it. They ruined everything. It is amazing. So, of course, they do a bunch of near falls, which the pace of the match and the the, the pacing and, and, and everything is just killed by AJ's wacky slow counts. And finally, uh, AJ got knocked out of the ring or something like that, and, and Christian ran down and hit Angle with the belt. And the story was that neither Christian nor Tomko knew this, but then AJ got back in the ring and did the longest recount ever. Not only did this show fall off a cliff, it fell into a deep abyss at this point. It may still be falling. And Karen yelled at AJ afterwards, and of course it was to the back for an interview with Christian, and he said, "Um, Tomko says he wants to do what's best for Tomko, so do I. At which point Mike Tanay immediately said, did you hear what he just said? He said, Tomko says he wants to do what's best for Tomko. So do I. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> show us such so fuck-witted people. So slow-brained people watch this show. They ruined this. And again, I ask the question. If you've got a championship match booked for February, and you've also got a championship match booked for March... Why, on the last show in January, did you have a guy beat your champion? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for this. I don't have a good answer for any of the segment. You've covered everything except, one, we, here's one we ask every week, too. Why do these guys work so hard? <laughs> because Kurt, or, Kurt and Tomko were trying their damnedest to have the best the, the best match they could in absolutely impossible conditions. So they would go a million miles an hour. There would be a cover. Everyone would stand there. Everyone would look up at AJ. AJ would hold up his hands. He would drop down. He'd count one. He'd beg the guy to kick out. He would count two. He'd say, come on, kick out, kick out. He'd raise his arm, and it started to come down. The guy would kick out. At this point, here's what really annoyed me. Mike Mike Tanay and Don West would mark out for these near falls. (laughs) They were actually into this match. Kearney would kick out of a 13 count, but he'd be out before 14, 
And Don was to say, oh, we almost had him that time. <laughs> like it was a fair and legitimate contest. And I, I, I watched... Who could enjoy this? How? I, I, I don't. <laughs> Name me one person on the face of the earth who could have sat down at, on the, 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 the end you. of a Thursday night. This, it's all the the people that will defend the show. Their excuse will only be it's better than WWE, which it's not. But they hate <laughs> WWE so bad that they think that this is better. These are the people that enjoy this product. Even if you think it's better, no. E- even if you uh, have such a blind spot for WWE that you think this is superior. That doesn't mean it's good. No, they think it's good, though. Who could sit down at the end I of a long know, Thursday? I don't know. I must there's ask this question. 1.6 million people that do. No, there can't be. There are. <laughs> there must be one guy with 1.6 million boxes. That <laughs> I would find much more plausible. <laughs> there's no way 1.6 million people can <laughs> go to work all day, go to soccer practice, pick the kids up, come home, and at the end of the long day, watch Impact. It can't be done. One this guy with 1.6 million boxes. That is that I'd buy. I will not buy millions of people sitting down to watch this show. That can't happen. I, I don't know. I don't care. This show. This show is bullshit. Thumbs down. This show infuriated me. <laughs> you Fuck ruined you, it. TNA. You ruined it, TNA. <laughs> you ruined everything, you bastards. <laughs> All right. I guess we got a new impact. Dreading it as always. From Clash of the Champions '87 to this show. This that was a horrible idea. Which they named friend or foe. Yes, last Art. week. Yeah, last week they had the great video package for Tom and Angle. This week, back to the usual bullshit. 87 things to be on in a 20 second package. Yeehaw. Borash came out in a Nick Brace interviewed Robert Roode, and he had to do impersonations of Charmel and Booker. This was very bad. Then he got serious, and it was actually very good. Yes. He said this was all Booker's fault. He said it was an accident in the pay-per-view. Booker knew it. But Booker also had to know that uh, he should be thankful because now with her broken jaw, she was going to have to lose weight and would not be able to boss him around. And he said, I want to say you're welcome. This was great. Wait, 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 Robert wait. Root is, is so awesome. Root doing the scripted, com- scripted comedy they give him was so unfunny, and Root just being a, a prick heel was so awesome. Now, I have a button on my remote. Yeah, that's right. And it skips forward 30 seconds. That's three zero seconds. Half a minute. 30. So when guys are coming down to the ring, I hit that button once, and I just skip to the entire ring entrance. got to save some time here, everybody. So Robert Roode's coming out for a match with somebody, and I hit that 30-second button, and all of a sudden they're like on another segment. And I'm like, what happened here? So we rewound and in that 30 seconds, Booker T ran down, threw the crowd, attacked Robert Roode, they got in a brawl, chased each other up the ramp, and disappeared. Less than 30 seconds. That's right. And as soon as they got to the top of the ramp, the announcers immediately moved on. They didn't care. Immediately moved on. There was no reaction to this insanity, this violence. Shit like this makes me long for that Chuck Palumbo segment. Something that we're actually supposed to care about. I, I, I will remember the Chuck Palumbo segment next week. And for the rest of your life, probably. I mean, in fact, I may still be seeing it. So then we had Matt Morgan screaming at Cornette backstage, saying Joe detect. I will give some credit to TNA very quickly, though. When when the announcers uh, didn't care about the Rude segment, they did spend the entire time uh, plugging the pay-per-view. There were a ton of pay-per-view packages and, and plugs during the show, which was good. Problem was, despite all of it, I still had no desire to see the show. Baby steps, Brian. Baby steps. Matt Morgan screaming at Jim Cornette, saying Joe attacked him and nobody done a thing about it. Cornette said, well, I'm not going to. He said, tonight, Joe, one of the biggest stars in the company, is going to sign a contract. And if Morgan got involved, he was going to have to fire him. Morgan said, fine, I don't like it. And Cornette said, plenty of people don't like their jobs. And I laughed. <laughs> Boy, did I laugh. Awesome calling at Tracy Brooks. Tracy now is a first and last name. The... Girls came out, and they immediately went to commercial, which okay. is always great. Let, let's review. The opening segment of this show was the video recap, the title screen of Friend or Foe, Bobby Roode came out, Booker T chased him away, the announcers played the pay-per-view, Cornette and Matt Morgan yelled at each other, Tracy Brooks and Awesome Kong came out. That was the first segment. 900 things. Yes. And when they came back, they were they were about to lock up. Yes. Still yeah. no wrestling. ODB showed up on the screen, cut a promo on Kong. She's such an enigma. 
the point of this promo, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. ODB said that she, she, not Kong, she is smelly and ugly. Yeah. And the fans cheered. Yes. <laughs> okay. And this distracted Kong, and Tracy <laughs> tried to get the advantage and still failed. Kong beat her with the sit-out power bomb after a horrible uh, spinning back fist and a move that is a released angel's wings, which they call the implant buster. Yes. Because all the girls have fake tits. Right. It, it drops women onto their chest and busts their implants. <sighs> this show. So, yeah, Tracy's in a, a major program with Robert Roode, and here she is just getting beaten in a match like a geek. Well, and the, and the other side of it, here's Awesome Kong, the most dangerous wrestler in the world, having a competitive match with Tracy Brooks. This was a no-win situation. No, this was a failure. And then, of course, Peyton ran in afterwards and attacked Tracy, and geeks came out to break it up. And to the back! I'm getting pretty good at that Mike Tanay uh, impersonation right there. Booker chased Roode out of the building. Roode jumped in a car and zoomed off, and... and uh, okay. <laughs> By my calculations, <laughs> they had been chasing each other backstage for 12 minutes. I had a dead sprint the entire time. That is at least one mile. <laughs> I had no idea the impact zone was so big. <laughs> Perhaps there's there's a number of circular areas in the impact zone that they went around and around for 12 straight minutes, but I laughed. <laughs> First, Robert Roode ran by. This is like a silent movie. Robert Roode ran by, then Jerry and Boras ran by trying to get an interview, and then Booker T ran by, and then Roode dropped in a car and drove away. Thumbs down. That's a thumbs up, actually. The idea of them running a mile backstage for the first 12 minutes of the show was a thumbs up. And, and that, by the way, that was the second segment. Yeah. Cornette interviewed Steiner and Petey, which... Steiner's so awesome. Yes. Steiner's gimmick is he has no idea what's going on in TNA, ever. No, he does not watch the show, nor does he pay attention to any segments he is not in. Nor does he care about it. Nor anything. does he give a shit. Nor, by the way, he's also aware that none of it, when they explain it to him, he knows it makes no sense. Yeah. He's he's a fan who watches the show. No, he's me. Or, yes. He's a wrestler. He's, he hates being there. He just wants to win his title. He was, yes. And uh, that's it. And make his money. All he cares about is his freaks and his peaks. Yes. So, I'm mad at you, he screamed at Cornette, for, for talking about taking the X Division briefcase when there might not even be an X Division after Sunday. So, anyway, Cornette ended up saying that on the pay-per-view, him and Petey were going to have a case-versus-case case match, at which point Scott flipped out and screamed, So what's that mean? <laughs> because Scott, the only person on the show with a brain, knows none of it makes sense. Cornette said, well, what that means is the winner gets both cases, and so no matter what, you're guaranteed something. That was his exact words, by the way. You get a title shot at something. Yes. This this made everyone happy. Why can't Steiner just take a shot tonight? I guess it wouldn't matter because there may not be a division, but no. what are they waiting for? Uh, what that, are that's we my other for? question about this. this. This stupid Feast of Fire Battle Royal was like six weeks ago. And they've we, never said when. We still don't know who won. <laughs> well, no, we know who won, but they've never said like when you well, actually get your shot. Yeah. They, they can't just say, you get it whenever you want. They Can't they explain something? We, we, we were supposed to know at the end of that match who was getting the world title shot. It's been seven weeks. We still don't know. That's yes. my point. Yes. Kaz and Black Rain in a pole match. The gimmick was there were boxes on four poles, and in one of the boxes was Marlena the Mouse, and in the others were mouse traps. Now, I realized that on the front page, being a math minor in college, meaning that was my never worst subject... <laughs> I uh, I said that it was a 25% chance of getting a mousetrap. I was alerted that it was actually a 75% chance at the beginning, and the percentage would change as more boxes were open. I will say that I did know for certain that there was a 100% chance that the mouse would not be discovered till all the other boxes had been open. There you go. The, the mouse is going to be in box number four. That I knew. So, yes, Kaz, who designed this match, had his own fucking finger snapped in a mousetrap because he's such a dipshit. And finally, he opens the box, he gets the mouse, and then Rain beats him up and takes the mouse. <laughs> okay, among many, many stupid things, let's list, list the stupidity. First of all, they have this match, there's four poles up, there's boxes on top of the poles. The guys come out and start wrestling. No one... <laughs> I take it back. At the very beginning, Mike Tanay said it was time for the four poles capture Misty match. <laughs> he never explained what was going on besides that. Of course not. They started to wrestle. They went for like four minutes before Tanay explained what was going on. So if you if you missed last week's show, you're screwed. Now, stupid thing number two. Dustin Rhodes is very tall. I don't know how tall he is, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, but they clearly didn't know either because when he climbed up to the top rope to open these boxes, he opened them up and he looked right in the door. 
and there was no way. <laughs> the first time he kind of realized, whoops, I'm not supposed to look in here. And he looked down and stuck his hand in and got mouse trapped. The second time he went up, he was he had learned something because he's not a moron. So he was like, oh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> he's, he has his moments, but he uh, he was looking at something behind the box. So he's looking at Kaz, the fans, thing. So he had his head actually to the side of the box. So at least he he knew he could not look in. But yes. They, they do not build the boxes high enough that Dustin cannot just peer into them and look for the dang thing. Stupid thing number three. We pointed out last week that Kaz called himself White Sunshine, painted himself white, had a white mouse. Well, we did not realize, Kaz did not go and acquire a white rodent. Kaz took the black rodent and dyed it white. That's what they said. That's the storyline. He apparently took the mouse and dipped it in bleach, and now it's okay. Now it's just white. He dyed the mouse. So that's a key part that we missed. He put the mouse in bleach. Yeah. To, to, to paint that it. That seems like PETA or something. I suspect be, that's uh... illegal. I suspect the rat would not be okay. So then the, the, the capper of stupidity, the point of the match is to see who gets the mouse. Kaz wins and doesn't get the mouse. Yes. Stupid. These guys are dumb. Booking an interview about the match with Rude at the pay-per-view. This was buys. He never felt hate in his heart like this before. And I will note that for those that have made fun of Dave and others, uh, no man has ever said you know more than Booker T did in this promo right here. <laughs> and it was a, a great little interview, and it is amazing to go from a fucking mousetrap on a pole match to Booker T and Robert Root and yeah. think that the same writing crew wrote both these things. It's inconceivable. How can that be? <laughs> then we had Johnny Devine against Homicide where they mentioned that because the pay-per-view was Sunday, this might be the last X Division match ever. And which begs the question, by the way, of why Johnny Devine wanted to officially win the X belt from Jay Lethal. He did that last week. Well, it begs the question why he's in a match where his team's trying to kill the division he's champion of. I don't know. <laughs> None of this makes any sense. Of course not. So Homicide killed him with the Gringo Killer, and then Team 3D made the save for the disqualification. The announcer threw in a line about how the champion now could retain on a DQ. And I thought, if this were real... Why would you make that change? <laughs> Why, after all these years, would you rule that now it's okay for a champion to save his title by getting DQ'd? Apparently they watched that Abyss Sting match with a shitty finish and said, hey, that sucks, and it took them a year and a half to react. God. So then we had, uh, let's see. Christian Cage promo. Oh, yeah. Actually, the, the, the finish was Devon running in, but he ran in too slowly. Oh, that's right. DQ, so. Yes, the ref had to count one, count two. And then just hang out for a while. I think it is important maybe that Devon loses that weight because uh, he's getting very slow at, at 280 or whatever he is. So then we had Hernandez making the save for his buddy and then gave Devine the border toss. And that was that. Cornette came out and for take two of the Joe contract signing, and they talked about money again. Oh, he's awesome. We had Nash out there with Joe. They were all smiles. And then Kurt came out and cut a promo on Joe. And it was funny to think that the main event is Kurt versus Christian because, boy, what a what a no bias main event. They've done nothing for no. that match that you could possibly care about. It's all about everybody else on this show. So, anyway, he uh, he threatened to break Joe's ankle and cripple him if Joe didn't call the match right down the middle because Joe is a special referee, which, again, no buys. So, Joe took the mic and, and said that's exactly what he was going to do. The pay-per-view called down the middle. He shook hands with Angle and then gave him a sidewalk slam through the table and then just left. And, and Cornette frantically retrieved the contract and said, here, sign this. And Joe said no, and he tossed the contract aside. Why did he do that? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. At least last week he was disrespected and a pen was thrown at him. This by, week, by management. This week management completely respected him, had a pen. Yes. He beat up this guy that came out to disrespect him. And then he didn't sign. Right. For no conceivable reason. He didn't sign the contract that has every clause and financial bonus he's been wanting for so long. What does this pussy want? He's a fat Why are we bitch. supposed to get behind this man? I, I don't, don't get no, it. It doesn't make sense. Then we have Borash backstage with a rock and rave infection. And I will, I will say this about these guys. Before they were that turn the channel annoying. Now they're train wreck annoying. You just can't stop looking at the atrocity that is this this trio. So she comes out and and does the Jillian Hall gimmick, which is such a grand irony because Jillian Hall's gimmick is a gimmick. Yeah. 
Uh, Christy Hemi has a band. She's trying to be in a band, like right. being a real band. And that and her advertisement on national TV is that she sucks at, at being in a band. Yeah. I just it boggles my mind this program. <laughs> so we had Rock and Raves versus Shark Boy and Curry Man. I, I, I must interrupt you here. They had the Rock and Rave infection backstage. Now, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the gimmick in and of itself, but this was everything wrong with TNA and comedy in a nutshell. They decided they needed to spend four minutes basically explaining the gimmick. They're grown men who play with toy guitars and think they're in a band. So they did their whole spiel backstage first. They did everything. Jimmy Rev said, thank you, Cleveland, or whatever. Lance White said something stupid. Chrissy screamed. They faded to black. And then they came out for their entrance, in which they did the exact same thing. Yes. To let everyone know, look, they have toy guitars. They're funny. Fuck you, TNA. <laughs> you, I, I, wow. I, lo- I love the Rock Raven. all the things to be upset about on this show. I love the Rock Raven infection for like two weeks, and they made me hate them. Oh, wow. Say they had a match with the Curry Man and, and Shark Boy. They cannot make me hate the Curry Man. No, it's impossible. I, I don't think it's possible. He is the only life on this show. <laughs> I don't know why it took this country so many, a decade almost, to get him over here. Dude, people have been wanting Curry Man in this country forever, and I'm shocked that TNA is the first group to actually bring him in in that gimmick. Yeah. Such a fantastic... It's... I can't even believe it's Chris Daniels. He has you know so I mean? much more charisma with the mask on. Than yeah, when it's, he's... it's unbelievable. And and I think Chris Daniels is great without the mask, but as Curry Man, he's just he's unstoppable. Better. We can disagree that he is better. Yes. So they had a fun, fucking fun little match just because it was Sharky and, and Curry. And he, uh, Sharky hit the stunner on Rave, and Curry hit the spicy drop, and then Sharky got the pin, and it was grand. I love everything about this except when Lance Hoyt, for no apparent reason during the heat, performed an F5. <laughs> it it was didn't funny. even make a cover. It didn't make a cover. Didn't It didn't cut anyone off. It was just a move. There was a great moment where Hoyt was standing on Curry's head, and Chrissy ran <laughs> yeah. over to do something, and Ho- Hoyt didn't know she was there and stepped on her face. And I thought, boy, what a... That, that was the whole team in a nutshell right there. That is bush lead. Accidentally <laughs> stepping on each other's heads. BG and the Bullet did a promo backstage, and it was awesome. I love the Bullet. I thought this was great. BG cut a great promo about how they were going to win the tag team titles, and he was going to do it with his hero. And then Kip came up and, of course, said... Wishing you luck on Sunday, and he had a big smile, and he hugged him, and I immediately yeah. knew you're turning on him. Kip came up and said, I am going to stab you on the back of the pay-per-view. See you in two days. You know what's funny, though? Three days. I was thinking about this. This is a turn that actually makes sense. Sure. You know what? You're right. BG got the briefcase, and Kip James thought that he was going to be loyal to his partner, and uh, BG actually helped him get the case. BG threw it, and he caught it. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So BG helped his partner get a tag title shot, and his partner did not choose him to get the shot with. Mm-hmm. This makes sense that BG would be pissed off and turn on them. However, because every single storyline on this show ends up in a swerve, this is just another one in the pack, yeah. and it isn't going to mean a goddamn thing. If there were never any swerves, if everything happened exactly as you expected it to happen, Mm -hmm. and then they pulled this fucking thing out of the hat, this would get some fucking heat. This would get some great old Southern-style heat. Yeah. Instead, he's going to turn. Everybody knows it. Nobody cares. Plus, the the, the Armstrongs have been cutting these promos for the past few weeks where it's just been BG and Bullet, but them by themselves. Kip, so awkwardly being inserted into this last promo, was just a flashing neon sign. The only reason he was there was to remind people that he's a friend of theirs so he can turn on them. Or or what they're going to do, what they're going to do, is because he hasn't been there the entire time and they threw this in here, it was a, it was a, it was the beginning of a swerve for a swerve. Meaning at the pay-per-view, he's going to come out, he's going to help them win, and they will all celebrate together, and Vince Russo will go, ha, 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 we sure showed them. We surprised either them. Either way, the point is, either way, nobody's going to care. And no one's going to want to pay to see it. Nobody's, and there is a way that they could have cared, but it ain't ever happening now in TNA. Then we had AJ versus Tiger Mask. i got to say this about AJ. He's so awesome. Yeah. Like, he was so good in this match that... You can almost forget all the dumb bullshit that he's involved in, and you could almost take him seriously. And I just watched it, and I was like, when's the last time we really saw AJ working like this? It's been a long time. It's been like a year. Yeah. 
and it's badly missing. This was great. And he won with the Styles Clash, and he looked like a... I think the good thing with AJ is he's so good that if they ever decide to actually be serious with him, at some point he might mean something again. It will not be immediate. Don't get me wrong. But I think that he's good enough that you can build him up to meaning something again. But right now he doesn't mean a goddamn thing. And uh, and I'm sure what's going to be happening on the pay-per-view ain't going to help. So that was that. We, we On the plus side, we got a great eight-minute wrestling match here on Impact. Probably the best match we saw on, on any of the weekly shows this week. Best TNA match we've seen in forever, actually. I just meant of, of, of TNA, SmackDown, or ECW. Then we had Christian come out for a chat with Tom Coe, and he wanted to know. I actually turned around and he said, do whatever you want, I guess thinking that Tomko might hit him or fuck him in the ass. I don't know. I forgot about this segment until you started talking. I looked at my notes, and I've written down, I have no idea what is going on. <laughs> <laughs> there was Christian was there. He gave Tomko a chance to hit, he turned his back and gave Tomko a chance to hit him. Tomko thought about it and finally couldn't bring himself to do it. And he left. And all I can think was, why does Tomko want to hit Christian? I don't know. What did Christian do to Tomko? I have no idea. <laughs> why should they be hating each other? Christian helped Tomko beat Kurt Angle last week. Yeah. And, so and why would Tomko want to hit him? Christian got Tomko a job. They never broke up. They just stopped teaming. Why should they want to fight? I don't know. And I also don't know why. Uh, Tomko beat Kurt Angle, and nobody seems to care this week. Oh. It didn't mean a goddamn oh. thing Pinning that Tomko world, beat Kurt Angle. Pinning the world champion is irrelevant. This 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 is a good hour. This was in the this middle of the, the good hour of Impact. Yeah. And you have these questions, and this is the worst company ever. Tomko, Even when it's good, it's just ridiculously bad. Tomko has been the champion, and the, the guy who I, I guess is <laughs> theoretically supposed to be the top star in Joe, and he's still just Tomko. And we had Christian against Judas Macias, who, of course, two, I guess, I would think that Judas Macias would be at least close to semi-main with a barbed wire mayhem match, but no, he lost clean to Christian. It, of course, yes, they, they booked a match with two of their top guys, so, so one of the guys in the main events had to lose. Good thinking. And, and by, by clean, this is what happened. They were, there was distraction from Abyss, and, okay, fine. If you're going to have distraction leading to the finish because you want to protect the guy, then make sure that when you do the distraction the guy immediately gets pinned, okay? That way, you've got the out. You obviously wanted an out because you have interference. Otherwise, you wouldn't have interference. Right. You had interference because you wanted an out. You didn't want this guy to lose clean, okay? So, if you have interference, and the guy that was distracted gets hit with a move, if he kicks out, <laughs> distraction nullified. That's what happened here. Macias gets distracted, Christian hits a move, Macias fucking kicks out, they do some more stuff, and then Christian pins him. That's a clean pin. That counts as a clean pin in He TNA. got pinned clean here, and they still had distraction. Yeah. I hate this place. Yeah. So Things got better then, because Abyss returned. He had barbed wire wrapped around his forearm. He, he went to chase Judas Macias up the ramp. This is supposed to be scary. This was supposed to be horrifying. This is supposed to be... Captivating. This was uh, two clumsy guys with barbed wire stumbling up a ramp into the dark. Yes. It did not look cool. And then AJ ran down. Yes, and, and then AJ ran down. 800 men had to be involved in every impact. AJ and Angle helped uh, beat on Christian. Apparently they're friends again. I don't know how. They, they were, were not friends when the show began. No, they were not friends last week. They were not friends when the show began, but they're friends now. And then, of course, Tomko ran down to make the save for Christian. And this was the go-home show, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to make you want to see Is Christian the match on the pay-per-view AJ and Angle versus Tyson and Christian? Why no? Of course not. It's Christian versus Angle with Joe as the referee, and I have no fucking idea what Tyson and and uh, and uh, Christian are doing. Tyson, 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 Tyson and, AJ and AJ are defending their titles against Bullet Bob and BG James. Oh my god, <laughs> this company sucks. Listen, I enjoyed the second hour of the show. We had a great match with AJ and Tiger Mask. We had a good tag match, and the, and the main with Christian and, and Judas Macias was very was a, was a good TV match. But it's all so pointless and stupid. I'll tell you, it's what, so insulting. I'll tell you what. What you got 1.7 million viewers last week. By the way, the rating was down this week, but uh, last week you got 1.7 million viewers. You set a new record. 1.7 million viewers watched that show. All right, you're going to get 17,000 buyers. That's 1%. Yeah. One fucking percent of the people that are watching Impact are going to buy this pay-per-view. I don't give a fuck how many viewers you have or what record you set. 
you're getting 1% of your viewers to buy your pay-per-view. Your show sucks. Your show is a failure of a pro wrestling show. 99% of the people who see it say, I don't want to pay for any more of this. Do you know what a pro wrestling TV show is? A commercial? It's a giant commercial. It's a giant, free, two-hour commercial. Mm -hmm. Not a 30-second fucking commercial in the Super Bowl. It is a two-hour commercial every single week for a pay-per-view. Yeah. It is such an ineffective commercial that 1% of the people watching are buying. Failure. Fail, fail, epic fail. Well, it is the Sunday night Brian and Vinny show. We're here to recap the TNA Against All Odds pay-per-view. I actually thought a little bit about just putting up a file of last year's Brian and Vinny show for TNA Against All Odds. For those of you that have not checked out my Fight Network column for this week, I suggest you go up there right now and read all about it. I had this idea when I woke up this morning to take a look back at Against All Odds last year. I don't even know why I had this desire to do so, but I did. So I look back at the pay-per-view from last year, and, and what a shocker to see that Team 3D was involved in a street fight mm -hmm. and a bunch of other similarities as well, the most stunning of which was the fact that the main event of last year's show was Kurt Angle versus Christian Cage for the title with Samoa Joe as the special enforcer. Are you serious? It was the exact same <laughs> fucking match on the exact same pay-per-view last year. That's yes. astounding. And not the exact same finish. It was, the, the other man won in this particular instance. But it was still... A, it was still a fuck bullshit finish. Was there still a swerve? Oh, I don't remember. I just remember it was all bullshit. There were ref bumps and people fell down and people got involved and it was crap. But anyway, the point was, same main event two years in a row, which I thought was quite funny. I also noticed that there was a... A street fight, hardcore, table, bullshit match with Abyss, this time involving Sting. And it was quite eye-opening to see that the Abyss storyline with Jim Mitchell as his father has been going on now for a year. Yeah. And still nobody cares. <laughs> Baffling. Don't... The best part was I went back exactly a year because now I was really like, this is a little creepy how similar this is to last year. So I went back and I looked at the ratings for uh, last year as compared to this year. And after a full year, a year ago, they were doing one-hour shows, and they did a new record for themselves at this time last year. And they, what was that? They did a 1.12 rating wow. and 1.6 million viewers. Well, you would think with another year, then they would, they would grow to another record. Well, this year, they did a 1.11 rating... And 1.6 million viewers. Well, to be fair, they grew a month ago and then came back down. They are, in fact, at the exact same spot, the exact same place they were last year. They have the same main event on pay-per-view, the same main event, even with the same special enforcer, the exact same rating, the exact same number of viewers, the only difference being buy rates are lower. What does that tell you? What kind of message would that send to anybody with a functioning brain? We should change things. Something needs to be fixed. Something is broken. Now, I will say that this pay-per-view, the main event of this show, everybody who is going to buy this pay-per-view based on a recommendation that I may or may not give here on this show, I ask you to please, during the Angle versus Christian match, as soon as Christian does the unprettier and Angle kicks out, just shut it off. Just shut it off. Because I know you're going to be watching it and you're going to think, God, this is this is a fucking great match. It's just going to get better from here. Take my word for it. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. In fact, as soon as he kicked out, as the moment he kicked out, this is what a genius I am. As soon as he kicked out, my brain suddenly said, bullshit starts now. It, it just <laughs> so it said that. You and Vince Russo are on the same wavelength. And no shit, as soon as he kicked out, bullshit immediately started. A ref bump immediately. It was all downhill from there. It was all downhill from there. We had Karen get involved. We had Angle crushing Karen. This was after the ref bump. We had Joe getting involved. We had AJ Styles getting involved. We had Tomko getting involved. Then we had Tomko getting in the ring and saving Christian from a chair shot by Kurt Angle. 
I'll repeat that. Kurt Angle was about to hit Christian with a chair shot, and Tomko ran down and saved Christian. He then, of course, turned on Christian and gave him his finisher, which begs the question, why didn't you just let Angle hit him with the chair? The answer is because there had to be a swerve on this show that made absolutely no sense. The announcers were screaming, as they are wont to do at every conceivable moment, but at this particular moment they were screaming, What's happening? I don't get it! This makes no sense! Indeed! It makes no sense because it makes no sense. Yes, this is an instance where it does not make sense because they are dumb. It doesn't make sense because it's dumb. This filled me with such unhappiness. Because really up until this point, I was a proponent of this pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. I was giving this pay-per-view a big thumbs up. And they had to give the same bullshit fuck schmoz finish that they always give us. And I guess it made me mad, and I, I sit here and ask myself, why, Brian? What did you expect? I don't know. I don't, you I, knew that it was yes. the same main event as the year before, and upon reading what they did in last year's main event, you should have had a pretty fucking good idea of what they were going to do this year, which was a bullshit schmoz. Why did you... Get emotionally involved in this. Why did you get upset? I don't know. I don't know either, because I knew this at the same time. I was like, boy, this action sure is cool. These guys are sure are working hard. Fans sure are sure into it. Too bad none of it is going to matter in another five to ten minutes. It never <laughs> fails to make me mad. It never fails to make me angry. There is an advantage to having your hopes die and dreams crush. <laughs> <When I see laughs> so you're never disappointed. So good. And I just, I pray. I pray to every conceivable God in every conceivable religion. Please just let this match finish clean. Please. That's all I ask. And it never goes my way. See, here's the downside, though. If there had been a clean finish of this match, if they had gone back and forth, and finally, for example, Christian had tapped out of the ankle lock, and everyone in the building had gone crazy and jumping up and down, I would have been so caught off guard that I would have regretted not being involved in it. So, well, that's your own fault. Yeah. So, I always so, get involved, and I fucking want what I want. More often watching TNA, this works for me. This was a three and three quarter star match. I'll give it that. It would have been it would have been even higher had they not done this bullshit. These guys worked so hard. This match was so great, and then bullshit, bullshit, all kinds of bullshit. It made me so angry that I I I was just down on the entire pay per view. And I'm sure as I go back and and recap this, I will I will say positive things about it, but. There was a lot of good stuff on this show. God, you wonder why nobody buys these shows. I wonder why anyone does. I'll tell you why nobody buys these shows. I'll tell you why they have the same rating and the same main event and lower buy rates. Number one, your TV sucks. I watched your TV, and of all of the matches on the show, the match that got the least amount of build and hype was the actual main event. Correct. They gave more hype to the the... The awesome Kong match, the drinking and the championship Rude match, and the drinking championship, and the main event was all about dudes being mad at other dudes, and whose side is who on, and Angle getting pinned by Tom Coe, and all this other bullshit, just retardity. And and the day came this pay per view was going to be on, and I was like, what the fuck's the main event this year? Oh yeah, thanks Dr. Keith for giving me the lineup. It's Angle versus Christian with Joe as the referee. That's one of the reasons it's a failure. And the second is getting shows like this and just having a sour taste left in your mouth at the end of the show. Everybody, think about in the Tomko everybody was. Killed. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets into a fun wrestling match, match killed. Bullshit after bullshit after bullshit. So as much as I love this pay-per-view, that finish made me not ever want to watch TNA again. So that's why this show will do 18,000 buys. That's my prediction. And with a... Uh, hitting 1.7 million viewers <clears throat> last week. Well, 1%, guys. Fine work. Fine work, TNA. And Kevin Nash no showed my interview. Don't, Dick. Even, don't even get me started. Dick move. So, let's, uh, let's recap this, this program here. The good, the bad, and we will not talk any more about the main event. I have nothing more to say about the main event. AJ and Tomko against BG James and the Bullet. For the TNA tag titles, they had Marines out there to do the national anthem, and the Bullet and Ba and BG were both in their camo pants and that sort of thing. And AJ came out with his crown. He was acting all wacky. They did comedy early. I couldn't even believe it was the same AJ that I watched on Impact to have a great match with Tiger Mask. Things have changed here. They got the heat on the Bullet. On the Bullet, mind you. 67 years old, can't do a whole lot with him, although he did take a power slam from Tomko to get the heat, which, that was something else. 
worked him over for a long time. BG got the hot tag, ran wild, and somewhere in here, what happened? What was the finish? I don't even know. AJ, uh, there was heel miscommunication where AJ leveled Tomko and Bullet Bob made the hot tag and BG ran wild. Oh, AJ hit a springboard drop kick to Road Dog's knee and they pretty much took it home right there. That's right. He beat him clean. Yeah. There I, you go. It, it almost looked like he actually blew out his knee and they took it home right away. He did not. So. so there you go. BG and the Bullet lost his match clean. And then afterwards, in ran Kip James to, I don't know. To see if Road Dog was okay. That's right. That's all that happened. That's it. It was the swerve. That's the, the whole story. They swerved the swerve. They swerved the swerve here. Let it be known that before the first match in TNA on this pay- this particular pay-per-view, the tag teams got in the ring, they prepared to wrestle, and then beforehand, two of them grabbed microphones and proceeded to bitch at each other. Of course. Because everyone in TNA must fight. They did the match. On the one hand, it was fine. It all made sense. On the other hand, as noted, they got the heat in a 67-year-old man. It was, it was comedy because you could tell Tomko was... He was very extra gentle with, with Mr. Armstrong. He was treated with great respect and, and delicacy. Armstrong, on the other hand, just leveled him. <laughs> he hit him as hard as humanly possible. In the face, several times. So, yes. sucked to be Tyson Tomko this evening. Yeah. I think I would have pushed that, punched that old fucker once. You I, know? You, 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 know you, you give him one, and then there's a, so there's, everyone can have two slip ups. After the third time, it's, it's on. Yes. He, he'd have been fine. He would have held up all right. I am, I'm not afraid of hurting Bullet Barb Armstrong. Then we had Karen yelling at Angle backstage. They had a fight, everyone. Yes. They had a fight. She sh- screamed at him in a shrill manner. If I had been sitting at home and I had ordered this pay-per-view, I would have turned the television off. I, I, was, I had written that same thing later on. When she first debuted, she was so awesome, and she has now turned the channel heat. An annoying, bitchy woman. And this time, she wasn't even yelling. Actually, she started off yelling about the, the wrestling stuff. She said he cared too much about the title. Think about that, everybody. Yeah, yeah. The title is, in fact, not important to Karen Angle. He cared too much about his belt. Her real problem was that they didn't go out on any dates anymore. So I have no idea what they do the other six days of the week that they're not at the impact zone. I don't know. She, she was screaming at him like like this was routine. Like she'd been talking about, before, talking about this before. And all I can think was, when did this happen? When did it come up that Kurt and Karen were having... Well, except for the fact they fight all the time, but when did she start to complain about them not being together? Well, Don alerted us that Valentine's Day was coming up and chicks got nutty. <laughs> Thank you, Don West Lothario. Then we had Tracy versus Peyton Banks. I like how Peyton has gone from being a crazed fan to a trained pro wrestler in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Well, Amazing. that's the thing Robert Rue will do for you. Well, that's, that may be true. Slapped Tracy at the bell, so Tracy beat the crap out of her. They had a, they had a fine little match. Tracy sold for a long time, then made a big comeback, and it, it, the people were actually really into Tracy, and they were chanting her name, and they were they were into her comeback and everything like that, and and the place was not even close to sold out. And as I mentioned in the update a couple days ago, there was a, a guy on our site that went to get tickets, and he went on a Ticketmaster, and and there was a a deal right there on Ticketmaster saying here's free tickets for TNA. Nice. And he got like three hundred dollar seats for free. So it was heavily papered, but the point was these people were passionate freeloaders, and there was a brief moment there where they freeload with fury. It actually seemed like TNA was something other than a distant number two in a two-horse race. But later on, that sadly it came back, but didn't return. But yep. Yeah, so finally, uh, Peyton. Charged into the corner and missed. Tracy rolled her up for the pin. And then Peyton tried to beat her up afterwards, and Tracy sent her packing. So apparently this feud has culminated and ended, and <clears throat> Tracy is now moving on with her life. <laughs> Tracy's a victorious. Now move on to her next foe. Yes. These girls had a fight. Uh, they, they just they brawled a lot. They brawled on the floor. They brawled on, on the mat. And on the one hand, neither, neither of them is Mick Foley. On the other hand, this was far from horrible. So this is a perfectly fine way to spend seven, eight minutes on a Sunday evening. Then the match ended. And Mike Tanay noted that they were going to go to a backstage promo featuring Scott Hudson, who, yeah. as he noted, was making his big return. Yes, he's back, he said. And all I could think was people around the country going, all right, Scott Hudson is back. Yeah. Woo. He's not back. I think he's here for uh, South Carolina, and you'll never see him again. We had PD versus Scott Steiner. Actually, first we had a, a video package. The theme of this show was the world's wackiest video packages. Yes. I can almost recommend this show just so you could all see how wacky video packages can be. Well, and, and sometimes wacky video packages are okay. The wacky video package for the main event was just stupid wacky. 
For this particular feud, I am fine with the wacky video package. Sure, but they don't know the difference is the problem. That is, in fact, true. One of the many problems with TNA is they don't know when to be serious and when to be funny. So we had Petey and Scott doing an interview, and Petey was doing this goofy promo about how he'd been doing crunches and push-ups in the womb, and Scott was apparently trying very hard not to laugh. (laughs) And finally, he called Petey a little punk, said he'd had more title matches or more title defenses than Petey had had matches, and then he warned him, don't copy me tonight, or you'll be in trouble. Yes. <clears throat> that was, yeah. That, I'm fine with that for this feud, though. It's Scott Steiner and Petey Williams. It's Scott Steiner and his mini-me. They're they allowed to be wacky. It makes it better. Then the match occurred, and it was fun. I <laughs> had fun during this match. Scott was just a crazed, strong man, and Petey was just a, a little bodybuilder that got thrown asunder and he did, he did in fact copy Scott Steiner. He did a Frankensteiner and a Steiner recliner. Steiner survived it all. And then we had a bunch of, we had a low blow in front of the ref, mm-hmm. a mule kick in front of the ref to the balls, Check. a uh, head shot into the briefcase, right. not a DQ. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so. There are there actually two of those. It actually culminates later in the show, but we'll get to that in a moment. So There's also uh, distraction and interference by a mysterious black woman. Yeah, we have a new giant female bodybuilder. And when I say giant, this chick is no shorter than about 6'3". Yeah. She towers over Scott Steiner. This gigantic woman. It, it's it's like uh She was in heels, but she's still very big. I can't even explain what this is like. It's it's just like if you took a normal person and made them much bigger. That That's close, Brian. Yes, very very insightful. Well, no, it, it's like... Uh, it's like uh, the, midget, the difference between a midget and a dwarf. One of them, one of them is, it's got really, really short legs and short arms and such, and the other is just a short person. So you're saying like this, they, you put him in the dryer for too long. This one would not have freakish proportions, like for example, Andre the Giant. Exactly. She was just a very large human it being. It was like you'd taken a human being and zoomed in a little bit. <laughs> she was humongous. She was tall. Yes. So anyway, uh, the best part of this match, and I'm being facetious here, is Scott Snyder wins after this woman distracted Petey and myself, and I'm sure many others. And afterwards, after Scott Steiner had won both a shot at the X Division and the world title, it was immediately to the back. No one in TNA apparently cared. No. They have a number one contender in two fucking divisions. Yeah, none of it matters. Right before they said to the back, they used them to do a fan sign. Did the fan sign say, for example, a big, for example, Big Papa Pump or two title shots or, or Feast or Fired? No. The sign said, and I quote, tickle it. I don't know what this meant or who it was referenced to, but they decided right then, in between Scott Steiner winning and to the back, they zoomed in on Tickle It. Yeah. Yeah. There was a point in this match where Steiner was beating PD up, and it was grand and glorious, and he was hitting big moves and pulling him up at two, and then he went to get the cases. So he gets these two briefcases, and the referee says, hey, don't do that. And Scott Steiner ignores him because he's Scott Steiner. He wears the, the briefcases in between the top and middle rope in the corner on two opposite sides of the ring. He uh, grabs Petey by the hair and by the trunks, and he goes to ram him into the briefcase, and the referee gets in the way, holds up his hand, saying, No, Scott, don't do that. Scott pursues the ref for a bit. This allows Petey to recover. Petey grabs Scott, throws him into the briefcase. Now, the referee had just prior to he had thrown his body in the way to prevent a briefcase shot. That's how concerned he was that this rule should not be violated, that no briefcases get involved. So then Petey does it. Petey gets away with it. He rams Scott Steiner's head into the briefcase, and the referee... Shrugs. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Nothing I can do. I'm only here to enforce the rules. It's out of my hands. Yes. And that, that's when I stopped caring. Borash gave Kurt advice about women, and this required him to caress Kurt and whisper in his ear. Yeah. And he said all Kurt needed to do was look into her eyes and say, I love you. And as soon as he said that, AJ walked up and heard it and then immediately left again. And it was comedy. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, there, <laughs> when there's a skit involving Yay! JB, Kurt, and, 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 and AJ, and AJ Styles is the one who comes out looking cool, things have gone awry. Yes. Then we had a skit about how the belt was the most important thing in the world. And I thought, holy shit, they're putting over the title for the first time. And then I learned it was about the drinking title. Yes. They are spoofing good business. They are. Yes, exactly what this was. They, they spoofed training. Yeah. Dedication. Yeah. The integrity and, and, and the prestige of the championship belt. Yep. It was all a big joke to them. Yeah. <laughs> Retards. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was it, to, to, the, to the word. It, it was 
past and former great drinkers talking about the important training regimen. It was it, it was Eric Young saying, I get up early to do my training, and he got up so early the bar was not yet open, so he had to sit in the street and take money from, from people who thought he was homeless. Then he began to drink and eat for a while, and, and that was that. And it was just... It, it wasn't even funny, and it was the wrong thing to be making fun of on a wrestling show. And that, of course, brings us to the match. Eric Young and James Storm for the world drinking title. This was great. Uh-huh. It wasn't that long, but while it was on, it was awesome. They These two guys work awesome together. It was just beautiful stuff. And that we had a hip toss under the cement, which was actually not beautiful. No, they were they were killing each other for a while. A suplex on the cement in which it appeared Storm landed head first on the cement. We had a bunch of near falls, including Young hitting, in the words of Don West, a backwards moonsault, which is his new favorite move. Yes. He called it the, the, this move a backwards moonsault several times this evening. Yes. For those of you who are confused and wondering what a backwards moonsault is, it's a moonsault, and Don West is stupid. Yeah. Jackie at the ring, of course, right in front of the referee, which was not a DQ. And this actually did lead to a cool spot where we got a double Death Valley driver with both Storm and Jackie on his shoulders. That was so freakish and so unexpected. Yeah. Well, I think, really, I, I, I think I've seen I think I've seen him do it before, but it still catches me off guard. Well, I mean, Cena's done it, but but, but I, I think I've seen Eric Young do it, but still, it's it's not as impressive because Jackie weighs like 110 pounds. That is a, a key. Yeah, she's five three and uh, five two probably, and just tiny. But anyway, uh, she threw a beer bottle at Storm, and then we had the greatest spot in the history of man. The ref's distracted. She throws this beer bottle in, and of course, the first thing James Storm does is to drink a little of it. So he drinks a little bit, and he turns to the fans, and he's holding it up, and he's like, Ha ha! I'm going to turn around any moment now and smash this glass bottle into his head, and he will be dead! Mm. And he's parading and, and cackling and such, and, and all of a sudden the place is going haywire, because through the crowd has come Rhino, and he is in the corner, and he is snorting like a bull. And James Storm turns around, and he is hit with the greatest gore that has ever been seen on this planet. He takes a full fucking flip bump and lands in dead man's position, where he remains per- perhaps till the end of time. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking about Audie Stretcher in this pose. This was the fucking greatest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Young got the pin, and that was the end. Yes. It ruled. A- everything, everything about this was fine. There were two interference spots here, and, and I don't care about either one, because A, one led to something really cool. B... One, the other one led to the, something that was the coolest thing I ever saw, and it was the finish. Yes. The match actually ended at the peak, which is something that is very rare these days. Yeah. But the, the, and, and as noted, this this is the greatest bump I ever, ever saw. The prior greatest bump I think I ever, ever saw was by Eddie Guerrero against The Rock in a match on Monday Night Raw when Rock punched him. And he took this spectacular double arms wind, arms doing a reverse windmill bump that was so awesome. It's been topped now. <laughs> James Storm taking this spinning flip bump off the gore in his match against against Eric Young. That's the greatest bump I ever saw. But there's, and actually, there's another strong contender earlier in this match when uh, Eric Young took it basically an enzigiri and he grabbed his head and sort of stumbled around and in one motion just stumbled across the ring and through the ropes. Yes, it was great. There were many other moments of greatness here as well as the aforementioned stupidity. Uh, with the with the bumps in the cement for absolutely no reason, but I cannot complain because this was awesome and fun, and 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 the interference made sense and it led to the big finish and and it set up the automatic program with Rhino versus Storm again, which I'm fine with too. So the only two things to complain about not, are not neither of them is actually about the match itself. One, the announcers in the middle of this match, this match here between Eric Young and James Storm for their drinking championship title, the announcers chose this moment to clue us into the fact that the barbed wire match would be happening in the impact zone of Florida because the South Carolina government was not going to allow them to. Yes, here, in the middle of this match. That was when they decided it was time. Not on impact, not even at the beginning of the show, right now. Two, at the end of this match, Rhino grabbed the mic and he was going to cut a promo. And his promo was, I'm not going to cut a promo now. I'm going to cut one on impact. Tune in Thursday. Cause yes. Because you, you got to plug the free show. Yes, I paid $30 to see him tell me to tune in Thursday for his fucking promo. I will say that Roger Ebert, for example, does a four-star scale when rating movies, and a, a, a great movie is just four stars. And, of course, in the wrestling newsletter business, it's very, very, very difficult to get five stars, and you have to have a really, really excellent match to get four stars. But if I were rating this on the Roger Ebert scale, this is a four-star match. This is just perfect pro wrestling. There so. was nothing about it that could have been done any better except don't take bumps in the cement, you retard. 
And we had Cornette talking about how the South Carolina State Athletic Commission would not allow them to do that match, the barbed wire match anywhere in the state. He said, however, when we promise something, we deliver. That's the quote of the year right there. Said the match was still going to be taking place, and then he destroyed a tomato on some barbed wire while talking about how it was the scariest match of all time and could change careers and perhaps lives. This was fucking awesome. This is the greatest promo of the year to plug a match, and it did not air on the free TV show. No. No, it aired after everyone had already paid money to see this match. Yes. Because why, Brian? Because they're idiots. They're retards. God. You're dealing with a mentally retarded here. Awesome And Kong someone gave them a wrestling company. Against ODB for the women's title. They had a... I, I, I knew this was not going to be Awesome Kong and Gail Kim. That was known going in. I did not expect it to be as good as it was. They had had a brawl on impact that was not good, and I had low hopes for this match. They ended up having a pretty damn fun little match, all things considered. ODB ran wild early, and then Kong murdered her and went to work, and people were going nuts, uh, clamoring for ODB, and and she finally made a big comeback and was running wild, and then her uh, the manager interfered of Awesome Kong, and... ODB wiped her out, and then she turned around and was beaten unmercifully with strikes to the face, a spinning back fist, and then was planted with a sit-out power bomb for the pin. Fine action. Yes, this this speaks to the power of Awesome Kong and what he what he fantastic heel she is. It, it's really very simple: sell very little and don't bump at all. Just stay on your feet, and everything's going to be okay. You'll be a great heel, and and, and take 80 percent of the match. Then, right before the finish, sell a little bit more, and finally take a big bump. In this case, ODB finally made a comeback, hit about a dozen kicks, and finally her Thez pressed off the ropes, and, and, and Kong took her first bump of the match, and everyone went, yay! And then the finish happened, and they went, ah, But it was awesome up till then. I don't understand why Awesome Kong needs interference to win her matches, but whatever. I can't complain. This was fun. I will say, and I, I hate to criticize Awesome Kong in any way. It was just uh, something I noticed. Hey, stop right now. Don't. Well, I will. Her selling really needs a little work. I didn't notice that during this match. When she was in there yes. with, with a big girl like ODB who was pounding on her, she's not really that great at selling. Although, when you really think about it, when you're 280 pounds and there aren't many chicks in the world like that, you don't have much of an opportunity to learn how to sell. Yeah. So I'm it's going all... to very much give her the benefit of the doubt. I know what you're talking about. It's actually the same spot I was talking about, which made sense, but... Kong was selling these kicks so little that when ODB came off the ropes, I fully expected Kong to either catch her or just step out of the way. Yeah. And when she took the bump, I was like, uh, all right. It, it, it's the same thing that Batista used to do. Where when he was no good. When he was no good, <laughs> yes. It, 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 it's okay as long as you just don't sell it all anyway. Sure. But yes, so for the, the, the 30 seconds or so per match she needs to sell, she could do a better job of it. That's true. I should also, other than that, she's awesome. Other than that, she's awesome and the best heel on earth. I will say that when ODB came out, they zoomed in on another sign. The signs tonight were odd in, in their placement and in, in prominent positions on camera, and the camera and the director's decision to feature them. The sign this time was, forget wrestling, just get naked. Lovely. Yeah. All right. Judas Macias. Actually, first we got a promo from Jim Mitchell that was also fucking awesome. Yeah. And again, I ask, why, why was this not on impact? Because they're dumb. Why? I just don't get it. Him talking about Mitchell screaming in pain, or Abyss screaming in pain and crying out for Mommy, and Mommy wouldn't be there to save him. Awesome. Aside from the bullshit finish of the main event, this promotion rules on pay-per-view. I mean, this was a fucking great show on pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. And I watch Impact, and it's it's a different promotion. I, I don't even understand how it's even possible. This is even more baffling than the Robert Roode stuff and the Awesome Kong stuff on the same show as, as, the, as the goofy, wacky comedy. It's like two different promotions. Often, yes. They need to take whoever's doing the one half and keep them. It's the same people. That's why it's <laughs> mind-boggling. Well, all right. I don't know. They're just, I, I don't get it. There's no explanation then. And we had the barbed wire match, which was taped at the Impact Zone which they were pretending it was live. So we were supposed to believe that a bunch of people showed up at the Impact Zone to watch this one match. So it was real barbed wire, or at least much of it was, and they really went into it, and it was gross. They bled. They got stuck. Macias took a backdrop balls first onto a barbed wire board. <coughs> Don't do that, kids. Sucks to be him. And anyway, the finish was a black hole slam onto the barbed wire board, and, and then uh, Tanae compared Abyss to Bruiser Brody, The Sheik, Terry Funk, Cactus Jack, and I believe a few others. And... This was a nice try, but it was, in fact, an <laughs> epic fail. Abyss is not as good as Cactus Jack and Mick Foley and Terry Funk. 
There's a number of things I could say about this, but yeah. I am not a big fan of barbed wire. If you are, I'm sure you enjoyed this. I, I, I you know what? I can sometimes see a, a, uh, I wasn't a big fan, obviously, of the stupid shit they did in the Briscoes, uh, Steen Generico ladder match, but I could recognize it was a fucking great match. This was like, meh, three and a quarter star match, barbed wire, meh. Wasn't even much of a match, just being able to recognize it as much of a match. It was just a bloody spectacle. I liked it more than you did, apparently. It was not, again, it was not my cup of tea. I don't need to see guys cut cut off. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about Chris Park's mental well-being, as we've mentioned several times. The fact that he feels the need to, to slice his arms open every once in a while just to bleed profusely from his arms on pay-per-view, whatever, whatever need that satisfies for him is probably something that should be fixed by a doctor, perhaps with pills. I don't know, but... Uh, it was, they, they were smart enough not to just dive into the wire. They teased it for a while. They pushed each other into the wire for a while. And about three minutes in, Abyss took one tiny little barb into the shoulder and he began to scream and wail. So that when guys hit the barbed wire, they made sure everyone knew, wow, hitting this barbed wire sucks and sucks bad. I should stay out of it. And they saved most of the big spots for the end. So it, it, it built to something and it built to finally Abyss's finisher into the barbed wire. So everything made sense. If, if you're the kind of person who likes to see a freak show, this was for you. And we had Robert Roode and Booker both cutting promos about their match later on, which were just awesome. And this feud rules, which is why I was not completely upset with the finish of their match. It was a it was a really great match with a bad finish, but the finish, which was Robert Roode having enough and bailing mm-hmm. and getting counted out after Booker T chased him backstage, sucked. But at the same time, this feud must continue, and I am more than fine with that. They had. Some great stuff, including Peyton actually coming all the way into the ring and it not being a DQ. And as we've mentioned many times, every wrestler seems to have their own set of rules. I have now determined that TNA only has rules in Orlando. Mm. Once you leave Orlando, it's the fucking wild west of wrestling and anything goes. God bless you. There were no rules on this show to speak of. Every now and then they have these shows where there's rules enforced and Samoa Joe gets DQ'd and bullshit like that. And then they have a show like this where it doesn't matter what the fuck you do. Someone could have done a run-in with a chainsaw, and that would have been completely legal. So, anyway, like I said, they they bailed, ref counted them out. And the funniest part was as they're outside the ring, the, the fans are counting along. They're like... Seven! Yeah, yeah. Eight. And we should add, it's not like they were fighting four feet away from the ring. They were way the hell in the back. They would not have made it back to the ring by 60. But anyway, the point is they're counting. Eight! Nine! Ten! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> so yes, fans of South Carolina are in fact stupid. That amused me greatly. <laughs> yes. So they got to the back and, and bailed, and then Rude finally uh, threw his girl out of the car and zoomed off and... And that was that. So, yes, this feud must continue. I presume they'll do a rematch next month, and Charmel will make her triumphant return and help her hubby beat Robert Roode, and all will be happy. But this was fun. This was fun, and I was actually totally fine with the finish once I thought about it for three seconds. I was annoyed at first. We didn't get the end here, but then it occurred to me, A, I want to see them wrestle again anyway, so they may this feud may continue. B, it actually made perfect sense. Robert Roode is a, he's a prick named Bob, and he's a cowardly heel. So once he, he decided he, it was too much trouble to defeat Booker T in this evening, screw it, I'm going to run away. Booker T watched him run away and said, I could win this sports encounter here by count out, or I could go beat the hell out of the guy who punched my wife. I'm going to go beat the hell out of the guy who punched my wife. Yep. And so it all made sense. Everything was consistent. It all fit into a nice logical storyline, and so I was fine with it. It was, it was chapter two of a, a four-chapter cha- story. Four chapter story. Then we had the backstage Delia Bob. I forgot to mention, this should tell you something about these these angles with Karen and how grating she is as a personality on TV. Earlier in the show, uh, Borash had told Angle to renew his vows. And so Angle said, okay, great idea. And he told Karen, and she was all happy and ran off. So, yes, on Thursday, Kurt and Karen are renewing their vows on Valentine's Day. And, of course... It will have something horrible happen to them, as, as it is pro wrestling. I predict there will be a cake involved. But anyway, afterwards, Kurt went into serious Kurt mode and cut a promo on Christian about the main event and telling him he was going to kill him, and if Joe interfered, he'd kill him as well, and and that was that. So then we had a Team 3D promo, and you could say anything you want about Bubba Ray, <clears throat> about how he's fat and how he's a poor man's Mick Foley or whatever you want to say, but God damn, has this man been on a 
promo machine fire, machine run. He's been Unlike on a roll. yourself, for example. He's been on a roll with these promos over the last couple of months. This promo was fucking awesome. And again, why did this not <laughs> air on Impact? Because then people may have bought the show. And <laughs> remember, Brian, TNA hates money. They they have to. They must hate money. They, they, they have to drive it away at all costs. That should be their new s- slogan instead of above the line or whatever the fuck that stupid <laughs> well, bullshit well, thing we saw at the end of the show. TNA, we hate money. Yeah. Yeah. This was a great promo and delivery, and, and, and even in content, it was he ran down the machine guns. He said, you don't look like wrestlers. We don't respect you. Then he threw in, we do respect you, machismo. We have a lot of respect for you, but not those dirty machine guns. And I thought, well, that's odd. <laughs> did the machine guns get cut in front of Bubba at catering? What did they do to get pissed off here? And then the match started. I liked how he said, you guys don't look like pro wrestlers. As he wore a flannel. <laughs> in his jeans, t-shirt, and flannel. Jesus. <laughs> and fat. <laughs> and gigantic girth. Then we had an awesome match. The best match on the show. It was Team 3D and Johnny Devine against the Motor City Machine Guns and Jay Lethal. Obviously, the rules were that if 3D's team won, X Division was history. If the Babyfaces won, then Team 3D could not wrestle unless they weighed less than 275 pounds. And as they were coming to the ring, they added the stipulation that if any of the Babyfaces got the pin, that guy would win the X title. I do not recall them making this announcement on Impact. Perhaps they did. If they did, poor job of doing so. Uh, it did, it was actually, they should have mentioned this every single time they were on Impact at every conceivable moment, because that's the only thing that made this whole match make any sense at all, because without that stipulation, why would Johnny Devine be trying to destroy the division he's the champion of? There's no reason for it. It would be foolish on his part. But with this stipulation, he either, uh, I guess what would it be? I don't, I, I don't see your point. Maybe I was He's still re- fighting to destroy the, the, the division that he is the champion of. Let me think about this for a second. You're right. This yes. still makes no it sense. It still makes no sense. Oh. I'm sorry to enlighten you. God, maybe I should be on the booking team. But it still made no sense. So why was he fighting to destroy the division? No one knows. I think I thought of it as if he didn't fight to destroy the division. Yeah, this makes sense. How so? Because he was fucked either way. Okay. <laughs> if he wins, he destroys the division and he's not champion. Okay. If he loses... One of the other guys is champion. Yeah. Either way, he's fucked. Well. E- even if even if, if Alex Shelley pinned Devon, Alex Shelley would still have taken his belt. Okay. So he was fucked either way. That does not give him a reason to fight for something. You can either destroy the division and retire as champion. Or surrender the belt and try to win on a later occasion. Well, maybe he has no faith in himself. No, no well played, Brian. You've convinced me, actually. Now that John Devine has lost, he can regain the belt on impact and be exhibition champion again. Sure. Well played, son. See, there well you go. Well played. Bert. I knew I was right here in the end. Anyway, the point is, they had an awesome match, and we had a, a classic Don West moment early on when all this plunder ended up in the ring. Garbage cans, wood, a sign, blow-up doll, and, of course, the kitchen sink. And as soon as that appeared, Don West said, and I quote, Everything but the kitchen sink. You can't say that here. Because otherwise, you know. Thanks, Don. <laughs> no joke, shit, Don. The joke may not have been expressed. And by the way, it's not as if there were 5,000 things in the ring and the kitchen sink was just sitting there in the corner. Mike and he actually asked, hey, is that a kitchen sink? Yes. At that point, folks, joke explained. Everyone gets it. No. Except for our friend Mr. West. Don West. Must still connect the dots, perhaps literally. So anyway, there was a strange moment in this match that perhaps will get explained on impact. I don't know what happened, but the Motor City Machine Guns took three Ds and were never seen again. Yes, they... And I'm talking about, this was, this, if this match were 15 minutes long, at the seven minute mark, mm-hmm. they took three Ds, they rolled out of the ring, and when I say they were never seen again, they, they were they were swallowed by the earth. They may still be down there at ringside for all we know. They did not return no. for the rest of the match. Mm-hmm. They did not return for the post match celebration. No. Nope. They were never ever seen again. Correct. These are some powerful 3Ds. And it's not as if they were taken hit by these. Th- First of all, they were not 3Ds through tables. No. They were not 3Ds onto chairs. They were not 3Ds onto shopping carts or garbage cans. They were no. 3Ds onto a wrestling mat surface. Yes. As same as they were taken any match ever. Never seen again. <laughs> <laughs> they were down, and it's not as if they wanted to finish three minutes later or four minutes later. As you noted, they were down for six to seven minutes, just 
vanished. Yeah. Poof. They may have just, like, walked fact, backstage. Now that I think about it, <laughs> the, the post-match angle lasted for a long time, and the guns were never there. No, I said that. Yeah. They were never seen again. They were not there for anything, the post-match or anything. They just vanished off the face of the earth. Like ghosts. So Lethal had to work the entire match, or the rest of the match, Half one the match. on three, and he sold for a while, and then he made a big comeback on all the guys, and finally he, I guess, let's see what happened. He uh, he, he ducked, and Devon flew over the top rope, and then he hit Bubba with an enziguri. They both got sent outside, and then finally he hit Divine with a sign. Divine landed on a table, and Lethal gave him a flying elbow through the table and got the pin. So he saved the X Division. He won the title. He did it all on his own. It was a hell of a little story there. It was, as the announcer said, truly against all odds. The place went haywire, and, of course, SoCal Val, who Bubba Ray had tried to deface with a cheese grater earlier in the match, hit the ring with her hero. Sanjay Dutt came out. Everybody celebrated. They that, didn't fucking go to the back. No. I could not even believe it. Announcers talked too much. We didn't need all that. But it was it was a great little moment to finish a great little match, to finish a, a great long several pay-per-view angle now. And uh, it ruled. It was just sad that the Motor City Machine Guns were not there to enjoy yes, it. Yes, and I don't know what's going on, but they, they were buried in the promo while, while Lethal was put over. And then in the match, they were disappeared while Lethal was put over. So I don't know what's going on there. It's kind of curious, but Val got involved when, when it was three-on-one and the heels were torturing young Jay Lethal. And Val began to weep. So Cal Val, everyone, not a good actress. <laughs> I, I did not believe she was actually sad for her friend Jay Lethal here. And then at the end, she she was... Crying, and I'm certain that she took a bottle of water and poured it into her eyes to get her mascara to run. It was just silly. But you need someone to play Elizabeth, so there you go. I don't want to talk about the main event, as I noted. We already talked about it earlier, but I, I will allow you, if you have any comments on the match, to make them and also to describe the video package that preceded this match. I don't even know if I can describe the video package. It, it, it was... The, the, Someone watched Ocean's Eleven and decided to make it uncool with teen A guys. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the closest I can get. They were playing a song that was like the, the, the classic Western Ghost Riders in the Sky, except it was the dorkiest version of that song ever. And then the theme of the video was that Kurt Angle, Christian Cage, and Samoa Joe are all very greedy men. That's it. I don't know. That's the message I got. So then the match began... And the heat at the beginning of this match was so uncontrollably out of this world. People were so into this. It was it was started with the, the dueling chants, and then there was just for a, for a while there was just a wall of noise surrounding the ring, and it was awesome. And the wrestling match was awesome, and and, and, and you know both guys worked so well together. And then it, it became it, it, you know it's almost cliche with angle. It's eight million reversals into the ankle lock, and then of course it's cliche with DNA. There's eight million ref bumps and interferences and screw jobs and whatnot. I just want to point out that at the beginning of this match, Don West mentioning that Samoa Joe is the special enforcer. He uh, actually believed that Samoa Joe would be able to keep this match clean and we get a good clean finish here. Don West, everyone, king of the retards. What an idiot. <laughs> How does he dress himself? Uh, he doesn't. Have you seen him? <laughs> Quite clear. Oh, there you go. He may, in fact, be blind. Okay. We've never known. <laughs> Speaking of video packages, after the real long match and the wacky bullshit at the end, a video package began that <laughs> there were TNA wrestlers walking under lights, and there was a flashing red light in the background, and they all asked one at a time, what is real? What is real? What is real? And then, what is fantasy? What is fantasy? What is this bullshit is all anyone can, can think. And I, I guarantee you everyone watching this had the same reaction. What is this crap? And when it ended, it was just TNA. Cross the line. David Sahadi is a... He reads a lot of philosophy, and he considers himself... I don't know what he considers himself, but I guarantee he wrote that entire thing. He wrote that entire thing, and... And only he knows what it's supposed to mean. They're, they're it's about, supposed to be very deep. They were talking about crossing the line between real and fantasy. And, and it's about total fucking nonstop action. And good and evil. This is not the Koran. It's TNA. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Yogi is not studying this writing under trees, is what you're saying? No, no, it's total nonstop action on Spike TV. 
And when it ended, I thought, okay, so the next pay-per-view is going to be called TNA, Cross the Line, March, whatever. No. No. It's just TNA, Cross the Line. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it was really, really the perfect way to end a TNA pay-per-view with leaving everyone in a state of bewilderment and confusion. Everybody get the show, but like I said, as soon as Christian hits the unprettier, shut it off. I don't give a shit, and I know every single person listening to this is going to want to watch a little farther. Just a little farther. Don't do it. It's like fucking Sleepy Hollow. you got to stop when you go through that little thing right there. Or whatever the deal is. Don't look back. Don't look back. That is it. Don't look back. For God's sake, don't look back. You'll all be turned into pillars of salt. Yes, do not look in Medusa's eyes. You can fast forward to the end, though, to see the wacky video package, though. That That's worth it. So... Overall, this was a this was this was a a fine event. I, I will give this show a thumbs up, despite the the thumbs down such uh, stuff that we we uh, talked about a little earlier. But you can't win them all, everybody. But this was a <laughs> just ask TNA. This was a fine effort, all things considered. I've seen much worse. So. Impact, also a show of love and mutilation. Self-mutilation on my part. I cut myself every time I watch this show. Karen and Kira got out of the car. Borash was there as her maid of honor. This was funny for a moment. When Karen said, Jeremy's here to be my maid of honor, I thought, hey, that's funny. And then, of course, Don had to go, hey, it's... No, I'm sorry, it wasn't Don this time. It was actually Eric Young goes, maid of honor. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Killed the comedy! Completely killed the comedy. God. <laughs> Explaining jokes is not funny. Eric Young also explained that he had to face a monster tonight, Relic, which is killer spelled backwards, he added. He did add that. He was a monster, he said, and Kira goes, there's no such thing as monsters. Yes, the five-year-old girl thought Eric was a geek. Yeah. <laughs> That's the show. Cornette was in the ring trying to get Joe to sign his new contract. He said Morgan was out of the building, Angle was getting ready for the wedding, there was no table in the ring. Yes, they banned the tables. Out came Joe. He was about to sign when Christian's music hit, and Cornette was flipping his lid, and I thought, why don't you just say anybody that comes down is fired? Is this really that hard? Is it really that hard to get this damn contract signed? The most incompetent manager ever. Does this really have to be done in front of the people? Yeah, that's also a good point. You can't call them to your office before the show. So, anyway, uh, they got into a big argument, Christian and Joe, and... Anyway, he offered to be Joe's partner tonight against AJ and Tomko, and Joe... Basically said, fine, this went on forever. Some line about personal and professional business, and he said he wasn't going to sign Cornette's contract until he handled his personal business, and then he walked away, and I thought, if you don't sign, Mm -hmm. (laughs) explain this to me, somebody. If if you're an unsigned wrestler, how can you be on the show? If you're getting a raise to sign, you are here willing to work for less (laughs) because you will not sign this paper. Yes. I have no idea why we're supposed to get into this Joe contract signing story. No, it's horrible. It's absolutely stupid. And and, and it doesn't help that Christian came out, the music starts. Now, his position's been nebulous for a while. He's been the same character, but he's been feuding with the other villains, so theoretically he's a babyface. But he comes out, and they show a sign that says Christian sucks. And when I say they show a sign, I don't mean it's at ringside or it's in the aisle ways he passes it. They cut to it. They cut to this fan who was nowhere near the camera to specifically show the sign saying Christian sucks. So I'm thinking... Okay, so I guess Christian's supposed to still be a heel. Then he wants Joe to be his partner <laughs> to, 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 to take on Angle. And everyone cheers. So I guess he's supposed to be a babyface now. He turned in the segment without doing anything because they're stupid. I actually saw him come out, and as he was cutting his promo, I thought, well, I guess he's a heel now. That explains that. I've been wondering because I don't have a script. And then, of course, by the end, I was like, what the fuck is he? What is, what? Somebody leak another script, for God's sake. i got to find out who's who. Who's on whose side? It is, it's it's true in real life. Crystal interviewed Tomko about screwing him on Sunday, and Tomko said, for five years, Christian bit a monkey on his back, blah, blah, blah. Said he was a star and, and uh, didn't need Christian's help. And said, as far, once and for all, Christian and I are over. Like they broke it up on Valentine's Day. You dumped him. I don't know who wrote this crap. This is the second thing in a row that made absolutely no sense. She wanted to know about Angle. He said he was going to have a chit-chat with him later on. And we had Crystal interviewing AJ about the main event. He said he wasn't taking the match. He said, of course you are. Cornette okayed it. And he said this was the worst night of his life because on top of that, Kurt and Karen were renewing their vows. 
Where did that leave him? He thought Karen was his woman. And then Kurt walked up and almost overheard him and then told him to get the tux on to be his best man. And after he left, AJ was screaming that he wasn't going to wear the suit. And yay. Who cares? Yay. Who could conceivably care? Team 3 and Johnny Devine came out for a match. They brought out the scale. Curry Man and Shark Boy came out as well. And if you'll recall, Team 3D cannot wrestle unless they weigh under 275 pounds. So they have Earl Hebner out there to weigh them. And Devon steps on the scale, and, and Earl Hebner just gives a thumbs up. Doesn't say weight. It's a pass-fail system. Doesn't say you're, 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 you got 10 pounds to spare. You got two pounds to spare. You're exactly 275. He just gave a thumbs up. Then Bubba came down and got on the scale and got the shake in the head. Too fat. Didn't give a weight, though, again. So first he took off his elbow pads and his tape, and Earl finally said, don't take anything else off. You're not going to make it. You're way, way over, was all he said. So since he was... um since he was too fat, it ended up being a handicap match. Sharky and Curry against Devon. And Devon still won this handicap match. <laughs> There's nothing better than a heel overcoming the odds, outnumbered, and making the baby faces look like geeks. That is exactly what happened here. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. And it was it was interference by Bubba. And what can you say? And, and and Curry Man got pinned. What what what? Uh, well, I don't even get into that. But what are we supposed to learn here? You lost. The gimmick is that you, you're too fat, so you're punished by your partner having to wrestle alone, and he still wins. <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't know. I don't How know. How is that supposed to encourage Bubba to lose weight? It, it should help him. He didn't have to do anything except hit a guy with a scale. Not to mention the whole idea of, of two-on-one, baby faces and heels. There's, this was inexplicable. Everything about this was stupid except Bubba's performance on the scale, where, where first he was trying to act as if, well, Devon passed, we're good to go. And then he reluctantly got on the scale, and that took a while. And then when he finally just accepted that he was too damn fat, and he just hung his head in shame and turned away. Yeah. That was all great. Then the match started, and it was all stupid from there. So then Bubba... Beat on the fish man, as noted, and, and uh, Divine, I should note, took a stunner in this match. The best bump I've seen since, I believe, 2001 in the Undisputed Title match with Angle and Kurt, uh, or I'm sorry, Kurt Angle and Steve Austin. Maybe it was 2000. It was December of whatever year that was. No, it had to be December 2001 because it was the year that WCW died. Uh, that was it the was greatest 2000. stunner. The evasion was 2001. No, no, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're 100% right. It was 2001. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they he took an awesome bump, though. It was great. That we totally agree on. And we had uh, to the back. This was the fastest to the back ever. Yeah. <laughs> Booker T was waiting for Robert Roode to show up, and that was that. He had to show us Booker T sitting in a chair. Relic cut the most comically stupid promo no, I've ever heard. This is the most comically awesome promo. <laughs> <laughs> Relic said things, what he was going to do to Eric Young. They included things like, I'm going to drill a hole in your skull and suck out your... <laughs> I can't even say it. I went and drilled a hole in your skull and suck out your brain. And he said more things like this. It culminated with, I'm going to plug them in your eye. Plug it. <laughs> I'm going to pluck out your eyes, put them in a martini, which I will then stir <laughs> with your finger, which I have bitten off. This promo was so awesome. <laughs> Relic rules. <laughs> I cannot top that. This was great. I love this so much. Relic must do a promo every week. Listen to horribly violent ways <laughs> he is going to mutilate his foe and deface their corpses. It was awesome. Ugh. So, then the announcers open up the show. 30 minutes in. Welcome to Impact. Scott Steiner versus Abyss. Abyss just came out, shrugged his shoulders, turned around, walked towards the back, took his mask off, and then walked backstage. And, of course, Don West goes, he took his mask off! Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Okay. They, pl- they they went over the barbed wire massacre thing from the pay-per-view. Abyss comes out, and he's looking at the bandages. First of all, when, as soon as I heard Abyss's music, I thought, Jesus Christ, he's wrestling on this show? They've killed the barbed wire stiff. But he comes out, and he's looking at his bandages... 
And he gets to the ring, and then he shakes his head, and he shuffles off to the back, and yanks his mask off. So, okay, the mask thing, that's just weird, but at least they're reminding us that, hey, this guy was in a fucking blood fest a week ago, and he's still hurting from it. He, in fact, should be scarred physically and emotionally and mentally from that, that, that war he was in. So, assuming that's where this goes, then I'm all in favor of it. Why did he take his mask off? I don't know. <laughs> And I also don't know why he took it off, and then Don said, he just took his mask off. That I also don't know. <laughs> I feel like how we're supposed to care that Abyss unmasked. Who could possibly, possibly care? Except the Impact Geeks. Then we had Steiner saying, well, I came out here to fight, so God damn it, get me an opponent. And out came Petey Williams. They actually, I think, may have had a better match than they had at the pay-per-view. It was actually really fun, and they didn't go to a single commercial. It was like... I thought it was in the Twilight Zone. So, ended up with Scott winning with a top rope Super Samoan drop. And afterwards, he helped young PD to his feet, patted him on the shoulder, and left. So, apparently, they may become a team at some point or something. That would actually I don't know. be kind of sad because this feud is so much fun because Scott Steiner is such a giant, scary man, and PD is such a small guy who takes a fabulous beating and then makes cool comebacks, and they work great together. I should note that uh, the they did, they did the spot now in both matches, and they must do it every time. Where Petey goes to the Canadian Destroyer and Scott just stands up. They, they must do this every single time they wrestle because it's always great. And uh, Scott's new, his new freak, the giant black bodybuilder chick, she has a name now. It is Raka Khan. Yeah. Don't, Rock, don't ask me. Khan. I didn't make it up. That's what they're calling her. Raka Khan. <sighs> then we had Tom come in with Kurt. Said he beat up Christian for a reason. He did not regret it. He did not tell us what the reason was. Said if Kurt could put his ego aside, he would join the Angle Alliance. Kurt was overjoyed. Tomko said, listen, however, I will not be your bitch. And Angle said, fine, no bitch. And as Tomko was about to leave, Kurt said, well, are you coming to the wedding? And Tomko paused and looked at him like he was the biggest fool ever and just said, no, and left. Tomko, awesome. Tomko is still the man. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, his reaction to, to this whole segment, really. He, he knows Kurt's a geek. But but he, he he says something about strength in numbers or whatever. But then when he got the winning invitation and he just he let out a soft chuckle as if it was so absurd to think he would even go to this. Yeah. How could this how could this guy be such a fool? And then just said no and left. Yes. He rules. Christian was shown laid out backstage, and as soon as they showed his body, they immediately cut the commercial. <laughs> it was even better than that. The announcers were at the desk talking about whatever. And Mike Tanay puts his finger to his earpiece frantically, and he got he got the Mike Tanay look on his face. He thought he said, "I'm getting word that Christian Cage has been laid out." And then they showed Christian Cage laid out. So this is the rare instance where the announcer says something and then it happened, rather than vice versa. And yes, as noted, they were so concerned as Christian's laying there, prone, not moving, maybe not breathing. They just went to the back. Yeah. Then we had. More ash with Karen staring at her breast, telling her she looked beautiful, and Young ran in and said Relic was going to eat his brain. And Karen screamed at him, I hate this woman. She shrieks horribly. Please shut the fuck up. Please. You know what it's like? I to say. Remember back in the day when Melina would be at Screamside for Eminem and she would shriek? Oh, God. And it got to the point where you had to watch the whole match on mute? Yes. Karen does promos in that voice. Yes. You, you unmute the match for this four-second screen that Melina would do. Karen does it for... 20 seconds. I cannot handle this. He showed a celebrity at ringside here. It was a pro, pro football player, a Super Bowl champion, James Ferrier, and they spelled his name wrong. Of course. <laughs> you morons. You morons. Nash and Joe against AJ and Tomko. Good guys ran wild. It was pretty fun, especially when AJ and, and Joe were in there. They teased the tag forever, and Nash... Got it, but the ref didn't see it, and he didn't care. And he just got in the ring and started beating everybody up. And, of course, the ref's like, oh, well. And so in the melee, Kurt ran down and clonked Joe, letting Tomko to hit a move of some sort for the pin. Kind of a mess. I have a new idea for TNA. Just get rid of the refs. You may as well, yeah. I have no idea what purpose they serve. Just let everybody wrestle and let them count their own pins. Why not? Or or let them let them get submissions or something like that. The rest are utterly completely useless in this company. I, I was so why say, have them? I was going to say everyone has their own rules, and the rules for AJ and Tomko are no tags are necessary for either team. Because even before the four way, it was AJ and Tomko versus Joe for like a minute. Yeah. And no one cared. No. <laughs> no one cared at Just all. Just get rid of the refs. It's revolutionary. You always want to do something different, right? TNA is all about swerves. No refs. 
a no ref match, a no ref promotion. Retarded. Cross the line. Cross the line. Oh yeah. Cross the line. That happened to Aaron Max and it fit in with your promo about being revolutionary. And then we had Crystal interviewing Nash and Joe grabbed the mic and said what we had just seen was a declaration of war. He said he knew he was never going to get a title shot until he did one thing. What's that one thing you ask? Sign the contract? No. He said the one thing was destroying the Angle Alliance. Please explain. I don't know, Ryan. It makes no sense to me. I could have sworn that Cornette said, if you're the special referee for this pay-per-view match, I will give you a shot at the next pay-per-view when you sign your new contract. He is pussyfooting around signing this goddamn contract, and now he's decided he's never getting a title shot. Sign the goddamn contract, dude, and you get it to the pay-per-view. It's always good to make your... Even I know that, and I hate this show. <laughs> make your hero look whiny and pissy... And, and stupid. And stupid, yes. <laughs> they buried him. He must skip the commercials, too, or something. Then we had Relic against Eric Young. Not nearly as fun as the promo. Except the finish was... The finish was, though. I don't even know what to make of the finish. Young was making his comeback, and Relic got in the corner, put his mask on, and this scared Eric. And Relic then clotheslined him to death for the pin. He was beaten by fear. Yes. The finish of this was Relic saying, boo. And Young could take no more. It was awesome. Then we have the worst segment I've ever seen. How this made national television, I have no idea. Hermie Sadler was backstage. The Motor City Machine Guns were there. None the worse from where after getting 3D'd and being out for the entire uh, pay-per-view the other night. They're just alive and normal. No Jay Lethal. They gave Jay Lethal the biggest push of a lifetime on the pay-per-view. He did not appear one time on this show. Oh. Impact, everybody. So... Then there were some NASCAR guys there and LAX. Everybody was talking at the same time. This was like that segment on Thunder years ago where DDP and Kevin Nash were in a room and this light was swinging and they couldn't stop looking at it. Oh, that was awesome. And you just thought, how did this fucking make TV? This was horrible. This is worse than that, though, because at least that I knew what was going on. I knew they were cutting this promo, and something wacky was going on with the lights, and the guys were distracted and couldn't stop staring at it, and it all made sense. This was just eight people talking at once. This is significantly worse. They, they both never should have been on TV. We had Jimmy Ray versus Chris Sabin versus Homicide. They sent out Jimmy Spencer of NASCAR to do commentary, and he was so bad that he made Don West sound like Jim Ross. I've never heard a worse man on commentary, and I'm, I'm watching Impact as I say that. They had some NASCAR geeks out there. Reed Sorensen and Juan Pablo Montoya, two utter geeks. Yes, these men, when they came down for this this match and when it came down the ramp and climbed on the ropes, they became the two least charismatic human beings to ever step into a pro wrestling ring. They're dorks, everyone. They're colossal dorks. I understand that the Daytona 500 is this weekend. I understand that a lot of people watch NASCAR. Is it really a national phenomenon? Does anybody in Seattle really give two fucks about NASCAR? Mm. Does anybody in L.A. care? Some. Does anybody but, but, in New okay. York care about NASCAR? Here's my question, actually. NASCAR guys are on the TNA show, so you would think, well, they're here. They're trying to plug your, their event. The concept of using Impact to plug the Daytona 500, that would be like Vincent Mann doing a, a guest appearance on our show to plug WrestleMania. Yes. That would be stupid. So I don't know how this benefited NASCAR, and by Christ, it did not benefit Impact. So this helps nobody. These guys are such dipshits. They're such dipshits. Listen, if you're going to do a celebrity angle, all right, it's gonna. there's two ways it's going to work. You either have to use somebody like Mike Tyson or Donald Trump that every fucking person in the world knows, all right? I don't care how big a NASCAR you fa uh, fan you are. I don't care how famous Don Juan Montoya is or whatever this fucking guy is in NASCAR. He is not a household name. Neither of these men were, all right? You either have a Donald Trump or a Mike Tyson or you hit on a guy like K-Fed who maybe isn't a household name. Granny probably has not heard of K-Fed. But God damn did he ever deliver. God damn did he ever back up his end of the bargain. That works. When you use these geeks, 
like, who the fuck were these guys? One I had absolutely never heard of before. Read something. Reed Sorensen. I have no, never heard of this man before. Juan Pablo Montoya I have heard of, and I think I only remember it because his name is, in fact, cool. Reed Sorensen and Juan Geraldo Montoya and all the fucking low-level baseball geeks that they get on this show, nobody cares. If you got Mark McGuire, maybe you'd have something right there. These guys are just geeks. If you could get Dale Earnhardt Jr., that might work. That might work, but still probably not. Because be, be better than Reed Sorensen. I guarantee he'd be no good in the ring. He, well, he'd just be a <laughs> dork. If you had, if you could get Barry Bonds, mm-hmm. go for it. The fucking demon and his geek friends, nobody fucking cares. This was such amateur hour, this match right here. There were guys everywhere. Don, 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 uh, I don't even know what his fucking name is. Don, uh, I write it down. There was a wretched announcer there. Uh, Don, Don Montoya or whatever the fuck his name is hit somebody with a chair outside that was so horrible. It was just embarrassing amateur hour bullshit. Everyone came out of this looking worse. God. It didn't, it didn't help anyone. You know what we may get at WrestleMania? Eminem versus K Fed. I, I did see. That is how you fucking do it. That, that would be worth my $400 plane ticket actually. <laughs> that or, or the other idea was a celebrity battle royal. <laughs> Which, that's just a death waiting yeah, to happen. I was going to say, that's a lawsuit, yes. That's Don't a, do that, everyone. That's a death waiting to happen. But K-Fed versus, oh my God, that would be money That right would rule there. the earth. Instead, we've got Juan Pablo fucking Montoya and Reed Sorensen. Epic fail. And Jimmy Spencer on fucking commentary. This was such a failure. On impact. When you fail on impact, God. <laughs> this is so bad. Usually when impact sucks... I get angry or depressed. This is so bad, I can only look on in awe. <laughs> it was just such a com- complete catastrophe. <laughs> it really was. And to think, wasn't it going to be uh, Reed Sorensen and Juan Pablo were going to wrestle each now, other? Now, when I think of that possibility, I actually get giddy. I, <laughs> I feel. Fuck I feel thinking. I feel cheated. I didn't get to see that. My God. Then we had Rhino cut a promo about how Storm reintroduced him to alcohol. This is James Storm, not Lance Storm. And he challenged him to a match at Destination X, but he wanted it Elevation X on the scaffold. I don't want to see that. I hate those scaffold matches. <laughs> Somebody's going to get killed. Also, he called himself Terry Garrett at one point. Oh, yeah. Real names, everybody. That Real means name. money. Crystal interviewed ODB. She said she learned from her loss from Kong that she could beat her. Tell me more. <laughs> Explain this to me. She said she was good enough to beat Kong three times out of five. We got the best Tank versus Kimbo commercial ever. God damn, it was great. They look like giant monsters. Yeah. Like, like T-Rex and Kong. Yeah. Gail came out for Kong's manager to be her manager. and Anyway, they had a little match. and Gail was holding Kong so ODB could clonk her. But Kong moved and ODB knocked Gail off the apron. And again... Two on one, <laughs> two baby faces taking on one heel. Are you guys retarded or seriously? Can I have some sort of answer for why I keep seeing this on the show? So, anyway, uh, Kong won again with the implant buster, and then, that, that's of course, our finisher now. Not the power bomb, not the back fist, the implant buster. And then of course, Gale and ODB got into a huge brawl, and and so now they're ensuring that one of the two baby faces in the entire division is going to be a heel. And then Team Prawn ran out, which I guess, I don't know what they are. We need the script again. Maybe they're baby faces, but they broke it up. So Booker was still waiting for Rude outside. Peyton Banks came up and said she was sorry for what happened Sunday. I have no idea what she was talking about. She was sorry that they booked a count out. What the fuck she sorry for? Who knows? What's she sorry for? I watched the match. I don't remember. <laughs> she could tell us maybe. So anyway, she said uh, Rude wasn't coming tonight. And Booker said, well, if he's not here next week, I'm going to go get him. And Cornette ran up and said he'd sign him to a match for the pay-per-view and said Booker needed to stop acting like a serial killer and then sign him to a match with Angle last week. And then, as mentioned earlier, we had the best of Vince Russo. This was actually really good, this wedding, uh, the vow renewal. Never thought I'd say that, but i got to give the guy credit for this one. They came out, and, and I should note that it wasn't – I don't know if it was all Russo, but whoever they got to play the pastor – Awesome. This man 
was unbelievable. That that was in fact as 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 Meltzer pointed out, that was a, a old school Memphis guy. Uh, Ernest Angel, I think his name was. He, he did a televangelist gimmick in the old. Was he the same guy from Impact a while ago? He, he, he is that, I think he was a pastor. He was in that, that horrific AJ skit. I do recall that now. Wow, they got Ernest Angel. Well, this man rules. Yeah, keep him around. So anyway, he came out and he introduced them. They came out one at a time. Uh, they announced that again explained the comedy of Borash as the maid of honor, thus killing it even further. So anyway, it got great. The first time it started horrible because it was such a low rent, low level raw knockoff, and this week it was even a low rent SmackDown knockoff. That sucks. That's even worse. So I should note also that on Raw they spent 30 minutes on these things, or or on uh, SmackDown they spent like 20 minutes. This got nine, <laughs> actually probably eight since they went off the air an, a minute early. So anyway, it's low rent, it's it's goofy. The announcers are killing the comedy, and I'm like, my God, this sucks. And it became great when both of them were standing there. The crowd began to chant, Angle sucks. And the pastor turned around and yelled, This is a wedding. And the reason it was so great was because he turned around to the people so that he was not speaking into the mic. You actually had to listen very carefully because he was chastising the audience and we weren't necessarily supposed to hear it. No. Oh. But we could hear it. Yes. That's why this this was like Edge singing that fucking song. This was awesome. <laughs> this was, this was, I suddenly was so into this. This is the preacher sincerely scolding the crowd for their their horribly rude behavior this this blessed event. So then he begins the ceremony and he's he's talking about Kurt and Kurt whispers something in his ear and suddenly he pauses and says, "Really? I didn't know that." And then he announces that Kurt is also a 12-time champion and an Olympic gold medalist. And an Olympic gold medalist. Had this pastor was many buys. <laughs> so he asked anyone to speak now or forever hold their peace, and AJT's doing so but stopped. And Q, Joe, and Nash, and they came out and said they were going to beat up Angle in the parking lot, but they actually couldn't handle Angle making the same mistake again and marrying a dime store gold digging skank. And they got in a big brawl. A bunch of stuff happened. AJ bonked into Karen, and she took a bump, and he fell on her. The minister got knocked down somehow. We have no idea how still. He we just wa- ended up on the ground. We watched it like three times. Angle got stripped of his clothes to play the Ric Flair role, ran up the ramp half nude, and suddenly as the show was about to end, AJ helped care into her feet. They happened to be right in front of the pastor. The pastor, who I guess his glasses had fallen off or something, pronounced, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. And so AJ grabbed her and kissed her, and now I guess they are married. <laughs> This was awesome. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm saying this. This was awesome. And here was Kurt. It all made sense. <laughs> it did all make sense. It, it was, was ridiculous. It was absurd. Yes. But it made sense. It, that, 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 that's true. It, it, was not, it was absurd, but it was not illogical. No, it made sense yes. in its absurdity. And here, here was Kurt Angle up at the top of the ramp wearing only his boxers and a bow tie, which is always comedy. <laughs> and he was going, what the fuck? I was going, what the hell is happening here? And and it, it it was it was wacky comedy. It, it could have been done better. Like the action when the action happened was all way too rushed. It, we should not know, we should not not know what happened to the priest. It should have been clear watching it the first time. It was a clusterfuck. Yeah, I will say that that I, I just got to give everybody credit here. Believe it or not, Vince Russo wrote this fine work. The priest fine awesome. fucking work. Angle and Karen fine work in your roles. AJ Styles, fine work, and uh, everybody else that ran down and got involved, fine work. This was a, a success all around. My, my, my only advice to you guys from, from, from that, the action in particular, but really the whole thing, slow it down and stretch it out. No cares. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give any corrections. This was You're this gonna, was a good thing for once. You're gonna be Mr. Positive. We might as well enjoy it because I just have a feeling next week it'll be shitty again. So probably that was impact everybody a thumbs up show. I actually I did enjoy that much more than SmackDown. Yeah, this was a thumbs up show. I never thought I'd say it. So we do not always bury impact when impact's good. We are fair and we say that was a good show. And this was in fact a good show. Impact. 
I will say the first ten minutes or so of the show was his usual wretched self, and then suddenly the the ship got righted and things were great. Actually, we watched more. Uh... <laughs> we, we watched some non-impact stuff first. This is what usually happens: is I show up at Brian's to watch Impact, and we don't want to watch it, so we just flip channels for a while. Last week we saw Clash of the Champions. Or a couple of weeks ago, Clash of the Champions '87. This week, Scandinavian Black Cox. Yes. In we HD. In HD. We watched. I'm, I'm really going to describe what the announcer said about this HD program. They are talking about the black cocks of Scandinavia and how they hope to sexually succeed. Yes. I'm not making any of this up. No, that's exactly what they said. Yeah. <laughs> it was all about the meeting ritual, the black cocks of Scandinavia. Scandinavian black cocks. And then, and then we watched some actual porn. Hotel Erotica was on. And we had to see if it was the Candace Michelle version, which... It was not. It took us 20 minutes to determine whether or not this was that, that version. Even though that was on an island and this was in the desert, we still weren't sure. I know when you when you hear that Vince and I watched porn together, it sounds, well, homosexual. Not in this case. Not in this case. This hotel erotica was the worst piece of programming I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was very No true. amount of breasts could save this bullshit. And there are breasts in the opening credits, by the way. I have never... I don't even know how this can be watched. I don't get it. I do not get it. And keep in mind... I can understand that if you're a fan of of, uh, of uh, pornography, perhaps you would want some sort of story to go along with your fucking... You know what I mean? I hope my family's not listening to this particular episode. But I can understand if you'd want a story to go along with it. But... It never works. <laughs> Well, this is a, okay. okay. This, this is a very poor story told by very poor actors. This was so bad that it made everything else laughable. <laughs> it was, it was very. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, yeah. I know where to end. Right here. Nothing more needs to be said about this except it sucked. It was worse than Bikini Pirates. Yes. <laughs> and those were actual porn stars. Oh my God. These were was, just nude models. This was awful. <laughs> And here's the most amazing thing about this, Brian. As I pointed out last night, and you did not believe me, this is not a movie. Hotel Erotica is a series. Impossible to believe. <laughs> There's more, they do episodes of this program. Impossible to believe. I think it's a rotating cast in rotating locations, but the deal is people get together at a hotel and hump. This may have been why Impact was so good. That's entirely I, possible. I don't know for sure, but I do know that after watching this 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 wretched programming, that uh, that Impact was phenomenal. So... Whether that was as a result of this or not, I don't know. But and by the way, for those wondering, we did not just pop in a, a porn film together to watch. We were we were flipping through the the pay channels as we normally do, and there was Hotel Erotica on uh, Showtime, I believe, in HD. And my God, let's move on here. Show open with Angle and Karen screaming at each other, which of course they always do. But at least this week it made sense because Karen married. AJ last week. That would be cause for strife in a relationship. If I were a husband and my wife married another man, I'd be, be tiffed. Yeah, so anyway, they, they got in a big argument. He said all he cared about was his belt and told her to go fuck around with her other husband, which I actually found funny. And she said, fine, she would go fuck around with somebody that appreciated her. And off she ran. It made sense, but the bottom line was it was still Kurt and Karen screaming at each other in a shrill, in a shrill tone. And all I could think was, fuck off, both of you, fuck off and get off my TV right now. So this gets a massive thumbs down. They promised Rhino like we'd never seen him before later on. Keep that in mind, by the way. I'll just jump forward. They had a Rhino interview, and it was Every I've, Rhino you've ever <laughs> seen before. I've always seen before. I, I'm not sure what we were not supposed to have seen before. It's just the music. Tomko and AJ against VKM for the tag titles. A shockingly good match, really. Uh, VKM tonight was Kip and the Bullet because BG was on crutches. I presume something happened at the pay-per-view. I don't recall, nor do I care. So, anyway, they got the heat on Kip. Karen ran down to cheer on AJ. Crowd chanted Karen Styles. BG, uh, I'm sorry, Kip got the hot tag and ran wild. And and uh, actually, Bullet. Bullet got the hot tag and ran wild. They worked over Kip. So, Bullet goes crazy. And then Karen took the ref and Kip got a crutch. And, of course, he turned on the Bullet and clonked him with it. And, and, uh, and that was that. And... It made sense in that Kip was upset because BG had not chosen him to be his partner to get a tag title shot. Didn't make sense that he was actually getting a tag title shot and he fucked it up for himself. 
But it also didn't make sense that he waited till the end of the match. Yeah. If you were going to turn your partner, wouldn't you do it two minutes in? No, he waited till the comeback. I guess just, I don't know why. <laughs> just because. And then they cut to a promo afterwards of Kip James, and he actually cut the best promo I've ever heard him cut in my life. Basically saying that where he came from, friendship was, was thicker than blood, and he was appalled that BG had not chosen him, and and that was that. And it was good that they had this because immediately after the turn, they went to the back, and I was I was getting very upset. But uh, then they ended up going back to the uh, the interview afterwards. So they did in fact show a replay from the pay per view of AJ kicking BJ in the, in the knee, which led to the finish, and that's why he was on crutches here. So that's a point for for TNA. They did that right. Uh, Bullet Bob's boots here. <laughs> he was wearing white boots that just said like. BB or BA on them, they had to be older than AJ Styles. These boots were ancient, yeah. and that made it awesome, too. And then uh, the other thing I noticed, we always talk about, you know, Kip James is a gigantic man. He's like as big as Tomko. Yeah. And <laughs> I was thinking about this. How did I, you know, I'm always surprised by how big he is. Why is that? It's because he tries to wrestle like a guy 100 pounds smaller than him. Yeah. He's never wrestled like a giant guy. Oh, no. Part of that, of course, he was wrestling Undertaker and Kane and those guys, but he was also wrestling guys like Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett. And he always tried to be a junior heavyweight. It's a strange human being he is. But, uh, yes, uh, they did this turn. They did the immediate to the back, which was for uh, a Gale ODB promo that was brief and made no sense. And then AJ... Actually, there was an important point to that. They said they were on the same page and would get along tonight, and uh, you know what that means. That means we will fight later. Yeah. And then as they left, AJ and Karen walked up. At which point, Karen convinced AJ Styles they were, in fact, legally married. Yeah. He's dumb. <laughs> well, maybe they are. I don't know. <laughs> I struck the preacher this. pronounced them man and wife. I. In the eyes of God, they're married. I don't know. In the eyes of the law, I suspect that's not true. Why not, though? <laughs> Seriously? Because the marriage license wasn't filled out? Well, yes. Well, maybe the, doc, maybe the guy had his eyeglasses off when he signed the thing. I don't know. Wouldn't it Kurt's name still be on it? Maybe. I, just shut up. Then we had uh, Crystal interviewing AJ. Oh, we already had that right there. So, anyway, she talked him into going out on a honeymoon. So, yeah. So, then we had the Kip James deal. Then we had a special interview segment. <laughs> That's Jim Cornette's exact words. <clears throat> Welcome to the special interview segment. Yeah, it was with uh, Cornette putting over black machismo and all of his accomplishments. And he put him over. Fans chanted speech. Machine Guns and Sanjay were out there. He put everybody over. He asked uh, SoCal Val to come into the ring. Said he was so nervous right now, got down on his knees, and then said, and I quote, Val, will you go out with me? And uh, she said yes, and now they are together, and Sanjay Dutt looks sad. This is the best segment I ever saw. <laughs> Just Lethal was so awesome here, humbly thanking everyone. It was also not rushed. They 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 let they gave Lethal some time here to thank the founders of the X Division like Jerry Lynn and Chris Daniels and AJ Styles and he thanked the Machine Guns for their help in his feud with the Dudleys and the hell of a job they did on Sunday. Yeah, Machine Guns kind of were sheepish about it, like dude we got our asses kicked. They don't thank us for anything. He thanks Sanjay for being for true friendship. He thanks Sanjay Dutt and then he the 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 great moment where he got down on his knee and he asked Val. Will you go out with me? Will What's you go it? out with Will me? Will you go out with me? Grown human beings, everyone. Will you go out with me? Well, he's not quite full grown yet. I guess he's not an adult, is he? <laughs> but he may still be underage. Regardless, this was all awesome. I love this segment to death. Then we had Crystal interviewing Kaz about the feud with Relic. And... Actually, one more point I need to say here. Sante that was simmering, and they cut to a close-up, and he was clearly unhappy with Jay Lethal and Laval kissing. And Mike Tanay and Don West didn't say a goddamn thing. Yeah. Not one of them said, look, Sanjay's upset. He's yeah. jealous of his friend. No, they let it go. I can't believe TNA did the segment. Yeah. It was awesome. So Kaz called Relic Relish, which was a highlight. And then Eric... Actually, the highlight was when Kaz said he was just another wrestler. He did. He said just like he... everyone else in the show. Well, as Eric Young ran up and told him not to go out there tonight because Relic might kill him. And he's, he's a guy. He's a wrestler, Kaz said. He's just another wrestler. And that it was all of TNA, actually, so... Cornette called uh, Joe into his office, said the door was locked, Tom Cone Angle were on the other side of the facility, security guards were lining the halls, etc. All Joe had to do was sign. He'd been on contract for five years. Joe said, well, I got more demands, and Cornette nearly lost his mind. And, and Joe said he wanted a six-minute the pay-per-view with himself, Nash, and Christian against the Angle Alliance. 
And after he destroyed them, he wanted his title shot at lockdown and <clears throat> basically said, listen, if I'm not the champion at lockdown, I don't even need to be here. So storyline is he either wins the belt or he quits TNA, I guess. So now you know who the next champion is going to be, for those of you wondering. They did, in fact, spell it out here. Oh, this, this, what an odd plan this is. But, yes, he's going to win the six-man tag, then win the belt, then sign his contract. They uh, will probably do something stupid. They but... will. In fact, there will be a swerve in there somewhere. But th- there was a, a moment here where... where Cornette has said, we're finally going to get you to sign your contract. And all I can think was, Jim Cornette is also sick of this angle and wants it to end. Yeah. Because it's stupid. Kaz and Relic had a match, and they did some stuff. And then Kaz ran up the ropes, pushed off, and landed in a cradle position like Austin. And Bret Hart at the Survivor Series got the pin. Black Rain hit the ring afterwards. They destroyed him, and Eric Young made the save. So apparently they're uh, going to do a tag match. Oh. Well, he didn't make the save. He no, no, ran no. out, and he was scared. He ran out, and he was a pussy. Yeah. And he would not get in the ring with the monsters, yeah. Black Rain and Relic, who you recall once lost a, a two-on-one match to Abyss. Yes. So, and they once job to a barbed wire Christmas tree. Yes. But Eric Young's afraid of them because he's a pussy. That's a hero, everyone. Cheer him. Crystal interviewed Booker about the match with Angle tonight. We need a drop of this. This was the most awesome promo I've ever heard. It was so great. Booker, I, I can't even do this justice. I won't even try. It made me want to see him wrestle Angle. It made me want to see him beat up uh, Bobby Wood at a later date. That, that's all we can summarize. He I al- can summarize this. Between this promo and the promo that Angle did before the main event, I thought, why is the best shit never saved for pay-per-view? Why is it always something stupid like a six-man that we could see on Impact on any given day? I want to see Booker and Angle, and I've already seen it with a finish. So, <laughs> no more. These people are retarded. Yeah. It's on like neck bone, he said. And uh, He also reminded us that Rick Martell once forgot his boots. Yeah. And that led to Booker T winning his first singles championship. It was so awesome. Booker was like a, a class above everybody else on interviews on this entire show. Like leaps and bounds above everybody else, and... It was a wonderful thing. Sanjay Dutt against Petey Williams against Johnny Devine in a in a three way. What a battle okay. this was! It was a three way right. for the X Divi- number one number one contendership to the X Division title. Never mind that Scott Steiner currently has a briefcase with the uh, guaranteed title shot in it. The, Who it, cares? There's ten number one contenders for the heavyweight title. <laughs> That's true too. Yes. So they began to wrestle, and Don West said. Johnny Devine now can focus on winning the X Division belt. He doesn't worry, have to worry about the division being abolished. Johnny Devine was trying his damnedest to abolish the X Division. <laughs> he was giving his life. He was sacrificing his body to see it abolished. Now he wants to be their champion. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Scott Steiner and Rocket Khan came out. There was nine million moves in this match. They did everything you could possibly do in a three-way. And eventually, Steiner bonked Sanjay with one of his uh, briefcases. <laughs> there was so much going on. The camera barely caught this. And Don West said, and I quote, what just happened? <laughs> he had no idea. And, by the way, this happened ten feet in front of him. Yes. So, eventually, uh, eventually, PD won, and Scott Steiner congratulated him. So, Scott has a guaranteed X Division title shot. PD is the number one, number one contender to the X title shot, and now they are pals. All I can figure is that Steiner helps PD win and then challenges him for the belt. That would actually make sense. That's what's Because he to knows he can beat PD. Yeah. That's the only thing I can I can. That makes sense, here. so it probably won't happen. I'm thinking too much. Johnny Devine looked good here, by the way. Then we had AJ and Karen at a restaurant with Borash there filming. And Morash was trying to tell her not to fuck with this poor guy, and she told him to shut up. So, anyway, AJ had some fake flowers for her because he noticed that real flowers die, so the fake ones were better. And he also had a snow globe for her. And she's like, what the fuck? And he said, when I was growing up in Gainesville, it never snowed. And I always wanted snow. And I would always pray for snow, and we would never get it. And when I was five years old, on Christmas Eve... I prayed harder than I've ever prayed before. Please, God, deliver snow on Christmas Day, I prayed. And I woke up on Christmas Day, and I rushed over, and I opened up the curtains, and I looked outside, and there was no snow. But then I heard a voice behind me, and it was Granny, in fact. And I turned around, and she said, There may not be snow, but I've gotten some snow for you. And it was this snow globe. 
and he said he was going to give it to Karen, and now every time she looked at this globe, she would, I guess, have a piece of AJ right there. And she was somewhat smitten. And then he ordered pork chops. Actually, he ordered steak and gravy. <laughs> steak and gravy. Yeah, it was close. This was, yeah, so uh, you summarized the whole thing, so I want to say this was a great segment. Five-star segment right here. Yes. It doesn't lead to fucking anything, but I don't care. I'm entertained. That's all I ask for on Impact nowadays. Great story. Just entertain me, goddammit. So, then tonight interviewed Rhino by Elevation X. This was the Rhino we'd never seen before, and it was the same one, except shitty music played, as noted earlier. I described it as stern music in my notes. <laughs> they interviewed Curry Man and Shark Boy. This is the greatest interview segment I've ever seen. Curry Man spoke Japanese, which was actually just him rattling off a list of famous Japanese pro wrestlers. I laughed like a madman. And then they uh, played music, and he and Crystal danced, yes. and Shark Boy cut a promo, and uh, this show entertained me again. <laughs> this team rules. Yes. And, uh, Curry Man and Shark Boy need to be on every show. Yeah. Which lately have been, so thumbs up. And they keep losing to the Dudleys, who are handicapped. In handicap matches. This is this is how stupid this company is. But again, I was entertained. Bubba somehow made 275. He's lost 60 pounds in seven days, apparently. Yes. So out came Curry and Sharky. Devon somehow did not make weight. And by the way, when Bubba made weight, Don West said, and I quote, "There's no way." <laughs> That's when the comedy began. The wrestlers get on the scale. The referee tells them whether they pass or fail, and they're either shocked or overjoyed. I don't know what kind of scale this is that can only be read by a referee. I just go along with it. So Bubba called Devon a fat bastard as he got booted away and ended up with, with him against the two baby faces. And, of course, he got the heat on the two baby faces as, as because this is TNA and they have no idea what they're doing. And... Bubba was fucking hilarious. Oh, God, yes. I laughed like a madman. And uh, he sold a crucifix like you've never seen a crucifix sold in your life. He did a wacky dance that reminded me of the, the day when Too Cool and the Dudleys had a dance off. And he, God, he was awesome. And anyway, the, the finish saw Devon hit uh, Sharky, I believe, with the scale for the pin. So, yes, the stip is that the Dudleys are, are handicapped in every match now that they've lost at the pay-per-view, but they keep winning. <laughs> so I don't know what lesson winning. is being taught here. <laughs> They're being rewarded, actually, for, for, for fighting one-on-one, and then now they get to cheat to win. Yeah. Yes. Bubba was so awesome here. He had the mic. I used to hate the Dudleys. I love them now. They have been awesome lately. But Bubba, Bubba tonight was the star of the show this evening when, when he got schoolboyed with the mic and screamed, Oh, my God. And he kept the mic for he had the mic in his hand for like a minute, just doing stuff, occasionally shouting into it. And then when Curry Man hit this crucifix, he hooked Bubba's arm, he hit Bubba's leg, and then tried to pull him over. And Bubba slowly began to creak backwards. Now, the worst thing that could happen to Bubba Ray Dudley here is that he would be pulled over, and then his shoulders would be held to the canvas, and he would be pinned. He could not feel any pain. Bubba screamed as if he was risking falling backwards into hot molten lava. <laughs> He screamed and she shrieked and his voice cracked and it was awesome. He was a great man. This the, the this the interview segment and this match were so great. I want this feud to go on forever. I don't care if they do these one every week. I'm fine with that. Just entertain me. Entertain me, goddammit. Angle cut a promo about the Booker match. Again, as I mentioned earlier, awesome. AJ took care to Gatorland and then wanted to get her some Gator Nuggets. And he took her to the pit and was messing around with the Gators using a rake. He wanted to know if she was having a good time, and she said, actually, I am. And he said, good, let's go look at the birds. Thankfully, nobody got eaten by an alligator. These segments were awesome. <laughs> These were great, yes. But, yeah, it was AJ, Karen, and Borash in the middle of an alligator pit, and thankfully, no one was devoured. ODB and Gail Kim against the Voodoo Queen and Jackie. I have no idea why the Voodoo Queen is no longer part of Voodoo Kin Mafia, but is still a Voodoo Queen. Just drop the fucking gimmick. Plus, everybody was chanting Roxy. So... I thought she was a heel. I, apparently I was wrong. Or it was an incredible partner's match. I don't know. So, anyway, they, they had a little match. And, and uh, as expected, Gail accidentally hit ODB. And Roxy pinned Gail with a blizzard suplex or something or other. So, yeah, we got the Gail-ODB fight afterwards. And the uh, match and the post-match brawl was actually fun with all the geeks coming out to break it up. Yeah, the match was really good. The, the booking makes no sense. So... <laughs> Gail hits ODB with a drop kick. Gail kicks ODB, and then Gail gets pinned. Why? 
is Roxy Laveau going to get a knockout title shot next week or the pay-per-view? Just entertain me. Just entertain me. Okay. Well, in that case, he's we were... not the champion. Well, no, Kong is, but I'm presuming that the, cha- the title match will be a three-way with Gale and ODB versus Kong. I don't even care. And Roxy will not be in the picture is my point. I don't know. This was entertaining, though. Today, he said he heard the honeymoon was about to end. Oh, actually, first we got the, the interview segment. Or no, I guess we did. Yes, we did. We had an interview segment with Nash, Joe, and Christian. And Christian cut the longest promo ever and said that this unlikely alliance would end the Angle Alliance. And I don't think Nash or Joe said a single word. I don't think they did. And this was just like in the backstage area. And, and the promo went for about five minutes. The camera cut to them. I didn't understand. I didn't hear a thing Christian said. He bored me to tears. They were standing. It was the three, the three dudes and Crystal. And they were standing there exactly like Queen of the Bohemian Rhapsody video, with Crystal playing the part of Freddie Mercury, Kevin Nash being, being Brian May, and Joe and Christian being the other two off to the side. And then only one of them talked. <laughs> just a strange, strange, strange deal. Nash just stood there with his gray hair and went, Hrumph. and Joe smirked. And then we had the end of the honeymoon. AJ was taking Karen. Actually, AJ was taking her to his room, but he wasn't taking her in. Do you always walk a girl back to your own room? That seemed odd. Leave her outside. <laughs> anyway, so he walks back there, and, and he said, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had fun tonight. Uh, he told her she was absolutely beautiful, and then he rushed into his room and slammed the door. And then he opened it again and said, you know, hold on a second. I got one more thing I have to say. He said he was confused about the whole two husbands deal, but there was one thing he was not confused about, and that was, quote, if you were my wife, every day would be our honeymoon. And he kissed her on the cheek and then ran inside and slammed the door again. And she was smitten, and she clutched at her heart. And then that was the end. And uh, especially after seeing that fucking hotel erotica, the <laughs> acting on this show yes. was top-notch. That's true. These two better beat the Oscars on Sunday because they were fucking phenomenal. And i got to say another thing about AJ. I thought about it when just his 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 him on this show. He was so awesome. He he is now, and what a coincidence that he's uh, kissing Karen. He is the young Kurt Angle. He is Kurt Angle version 2.0. He's a, he's a great wrestler. They've got virtually the same physique, although Angle's a little wow. more freaky. But uh, and they're both total geeks, and they play the geek role awesome. And, in the end, neither of them draws a dime. It's perfect. They are both miscast, but they are doing the, they're doing the wrong thing, but they're doing it very well. Yes. They, there you they, go. They are, they, are, they are making zero dollars doing this. Nobody will ever take them seriously. But, goddamn, they're funny when they do it. So, i got to give the guy credit for that, but uh, TNA's retarded. Then we had Angle and Booker, and, as expected, they had a, a really good match. And, and who should interfere at the end but Robert Roode? And the air just went out of the crowd, not in a good way. Angle hit Booker with the angle slam for the pin, and, and then uh, they doubled on him, and then Christian made the save, and we got the best quote of the night. Angle and Rude are beating on Booker two-on-one. Mm-hmm. Christian comes out to save Booker, but the bad guys beat on him as well. So now Bobby Rude and Kurt Angle are beating up Christian and Booker T. And Don West said, it's the numbers game. The numbers game. Do you just... Two against two <laughs> is the numbers game for the heels. It's not fair that the heels have the same number of people as the baby faces. This is how impotent the baby faces on this show were. So how did the baby faces run off the heels? Well, Nash and Joe ran in, so it was four on two, and the heels finally bailed. You got to counter that numbers game. Vince Russo. <laughs> There's, this even, is a good show, even everybody. Even in his best work, which we've seen in the last two weeks, still a fucking moron. It's the numbers game. It's the numbers game when it's two against two. The other great moment was during the match, Booker T had a spine buster. And Mike Tanae screamed, there's a spine buster to the back of Kurt Angle. And they actually thought they were going to the back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought in the middle of this match they were going to do a promo with Crystal and Shark Boy or something. It's very likely. So they, they've cursed me for life. 